What's popping out? Today we're going to be talking about Drake and more importantly, this is the first episode in a new series I'm doing as you can probably tell from the second half of the title. So a brief overview of what each of the videos is going to be on. There's a lot of misconceptions about the book 48 Laws of Power. When I first read it back in 2012, I enjoyed it as much as I do today. And I don't want to use the word overrated because it's not, but misunderstood I'd say. People see it as some sort of evil way to manipulate people and it can be used that way, but it also equips the reader with the tools to just navigate the world and human-to-human -human interactions. Each video will be based on a chapter. The chapters of the book outline a couple of different historical stories, both of people adhering to the law and getting reward for it, and also those failing to adhere to the law and getting punished, sometimes even dying, because of it. I'm going to just share one from each chapter, or two at most, and give the bare bones, then relate it to a rapper that's or artist that's either knowingly or unknowingly implemented or failed to implement that law. The reason I started this video series is because I love Robert Greene's writing style, his books, and I want to get you guys to read the book. So what better way than to tie it into something you're interested in? If you like analysis videos on hip hop and rap that you're not going to find anywhere else, then subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. Let's get right into it. The first law is never outshine the master. And Drake, out of any other rapper I've seen, has total mastery of this law from both sides. One of the stories shared here is about the relationship between King Louis XIV of France and his superintendent of finances, Nicolas Fouquet. Fouquet was one of the king's most beloved and smartest workers who loved women, parties, art, and of course, money to live this kind of lifestyle. When the prime minister died in 1661, Fouquet expected a promotion, but not only did he not get one, the king decided to do away with that position entirely. This, among other things, started to get Fouquet questioning if the king no longer liked him, and to get the king on his good side, he decided to throw the most extravagant party the world had ever seen. The party's hidden but somewhat obvious purpose was to celebrate Fouquet's newly finished chateau, but it was presented as a tribute to King Louis XIV, who was going to be the guest of honor. All the nobility of Europe and some of the smartest people were there. I'm not going to sit here and try to pronounce all those French names. My French isn't a strong suit of mine, but take my word for it, they were pretty damn important. He even had a famous playwright, Moliere, write a play just for the occasion, and then perform it at the end of the evening. The party started off with a seven-course dinner with food many had never tasted before in their lives, and new recipes created just for the event, with music played during and throughout. Afterwards, there was a promenade through the Chateau Gardens, Fountain, and Ground, the chateau that Fouquet had built. He personally walked with the king through all the flower beds, and at the canal, they watched the fireworks after the performance of the play. Everyone at the party agreed it was the most amazing experience and party that they had ever attended. Fouquet thought surely he would get the role of prime minister after such a successful party. The next morning, he was arrested and three months later was on trial for stealing from the country's treasury, which he was guilty of, but he was instructed to do so and the stealing on behalf of the king himself. He was found guilty and sent to the most isolated prison in France where he spent the last 20 years of his life. So you're probably wondering, where the hell did it all go wrong? Well, let's look at what happened afterwards. The king hired a new finance minister by the name of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was known for having the most boring parties in Paris and made sure all of the money taken from the treasury went straight into the king's pockets. With all that money, King Louis XIV hired the same architects, same decorators, and garden designers that Fouquet used, but made a more magnificent palace that you've probably heard of, the Palace of Versailles. And in this palace, he would host bigger and better parties than the one Fouquet had hosted. Fouquet had good intentions, but as you can probably see by now, the king was very arrogant and wanted attention on him and his achievements all the time and didn't want anyone to outshine him. Fouquet thought the huge spectacle would show his great taste, connections, and popularity that are good qualities of someone who wants to be a prime minister. However, the king interpreted it differently. Every compliment and smile that Fouquet received from the guests was one taken away from him, and he felt that Fouquet was showing off his wealth and power. The king's own friends and subjects seemed to be more charmed by Fouquet than the king, and this was very unsettling, so he had to do away with him and one-up him. 
Drake didn't make the same mistake as Fouquet and treads very carefully when it comes to his predecessors or those above him. Two I'll mention in this video, and the first being the most obvious, Lil Wayne. The amount of love Drake has for Lil Wayne is unlike any I've ever seen between a mentor and mentee. Drake has been quoted as saying, Lil Wayne, who is actually responsible for my career, has always been a huge influence to me and one of my heroes. Wayne's done more for my career than Jay-Z. Wayne is the reason I'm here. Ladies and gentlemen, in this lifetime, there is only one greatest rapper of all time. Make some noise for Lil Wayne one time. I learned from the greatest nigga. Nobody can touch me. You understand what I'm saying? I learned from the greatest to ever do this. You understand? Y'all make some noise for Lil Wayne. Some might say he's just showing love and appreciation for the man that helped set him on the course to get to the level he's at right now, and I agree, but he's even got a tattoo of the man's face on his arm. That's another level of commitment. And even though Drake is up there in terms of measurable accomplishments like sales and awards, he still has the same level of respect and never wanting to outshine or appear better than Lil Wayne. When mentioning Lil Wayne or even just being around Lil Wayne, like on their tour together, you can see Drake an entirely different person than when he's on his own. He's giving a lot of the lead to Lil Wayne and making sure he has an ample amount of attention, crowd cheering, and spotlight on him. He's a lot more humble, yet when Drake is on his own, he has a stronger presence, is more dominant on the stage, and commands the attention all for himself. Drake has done the same thing with Eminem, another rapper who you could consider Drake's master in terms of hierarchy. Back in 2016, August 3rd to be exact, there was a rumor started by none other than Ebro at Hot 97 where he said, I told Drake that the rumor was that Eminem was going to gear up to come after him. He laughed. He was like, that's not going to happen. He'd never do that, and if he did, I've got something for him too. This was a private convo, that's what he said. This started making headlines all throughout the internet and was viral for a couple of days. Drake would respond with an Instagram post with a caption from his album Views saying, if they don't have a story these days, and Ebro would eventually say it was all a joke, but the arguments between both fan bases were heating up and many people were saying Drake was better and would win. And how did Drake respond? On the Detroit leg of his Views tour, on August 16th, he would bring out Eminem as a surprise guest, and I quote, Detroit, make some noise for the greatest rapper to ever get on that mother effing microphone, he goes by the name of Eminem. And he also bows multiple times before him, then they perform forever together. If you recall earlier in this video, Drake said the same exact thing about Lil Wayne. I'm not saying he was being disingenuous about either statement because back in 2009, he did tweet Eminem equals greatness. He was once again making himself feel far inferior to Eminem in the eyes of the people because he knew that if a beef were to begin between them, Drake was in no position to beat him out. Eminem's accomplishments and fan base, and even rapping ability in a track aimed at someone far exceed that of Drake, so this is a battle he didn't want to fight, but not only that, he wanted to make sure Eminem knew he wasn't a threat to him whatsoever. There's also a reversal to this law, which Drake takes advantage of. There's a reversal to every law in this book. There's a quote saying, If your superior is a falling star, there is nothing to fear from outshining him. Do not be merciful. Your master had no such scruples in his own cold-blooded climb to the top. Gauge his strength. If he is weak, discreetly hasten his downfall. Outdo. Outcharm outsmart him at key moments. If he is very weak and ready to fall, let nature take its course. Your master will fall someday, and if you play it right, you will outlive and someday outshine him. And this example is none other than Kanye West. I did a whole video on Drake and Kanye West's beef that I'll have linked in the description as well as the cards and end screens, so go watch that afterwards if you want more details. Kanye West is an individual that Drake has had nothing but praise for until about 2012 where he began to throw slight jabs and all culminating to 2018 where he took massive shots at Kanye West and this I believe was definitely calculated. We're going to jump to 2017. Kanye West was going crazy on the Pablo tour and even cut the tour early. He ranted on stage about Drake and DJ Khaled's For Free song that was all over the radio and saying it was set up to be played all the time but clarified saying I love Drake and I love Khaled. When asked about it, Drake didn't reply with any anger or anything. Kanye had already done enough damage to himself. He just said, I'm not really sure what he's referring to half the time. Because in the same breath, I went from being like working on a project with him to him sort of publicly taking a crap on me and DJ Khaled for being on the radio too much. I'm not sure why we're the target of your choice that you made that night. And yeah, I accept what you're going through. 
and I just go and continue working on my own thing. Then fast forward to May of 2018, when Pusha T releases Infrared, produced by Kanye West, accusing Drake of having ghostwriters. This leads to their back and forth beef, eventually ending with Story of Addie Dawn. Kanye also released a track off his album Ye titled No Mistakes, where he raps, too rich to fight you, calm down you light skin, which everyone interpreted as a beef, or diss, towards Drake. And on June 29th, Drake released his album Scorpion with a handful of songs aimed at Kanye West as direct as possible without mentioning his name. He would also feature on Travis Scott's Sicko Mode, who is Kanye West's brother-in-law, where he's also coming at Kanye throughout his entire verse. On French Montana's No Stylist, he raps, Toto the Wano 350's Around Me, that this verse was leaked months earlier and it wasn't changed. Keep in mind the rules of the reversal. Kanye was already in a very vulnerable position. Not only from the mental issues of the Pablo tour, the bipolar from promoting the Ye album, and also having been focusing on fashion and the Yeezy brand for the past five or so years, and on top of that, from wearing the Make America Great Again hat and showing love for Donald Trump starting April of last year. This got a huge amount of hip-hop and Kanye West fans incredibly angry at him, and this was a culmination of different things that allowed for Drake to make his attack. Kanye West would come out on multiple interviews and tweets saying Drake was sending him purple demon emojis and just expressing an insane amount of fear online. Many people were straight up clowning him and Drake didn't say anything publicly. He just watched. The only mention of the beef in depth was on LeBron James' show where Drake was interviewed. Drake wasn't done though. On his New Year's Eve party, he invited Kendall and Kylie Jenner as well as Travis Scott, and they all came. This made Kanye look ridiculously weak in the public. Of course, there were pictures and headlines about it everywhere. His own family members had so little respect for him that they would show up to his enemy's party who threatened to be circling around their home in a song. That's how it looked to the public and how I believe Drake intended for it to look in the public. Drake is after Kanye West's throne, and as it stands right now, it looks like Drake is acting more like the master than Kanye West is. Law 2 is titled, Never Put Too Much Trust in Friends, Learn How to Use Enemies. Be wary of friends, they'll betray you more quickly, for they are easily aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical. But hire a former enemy and he will be more loyal than a friend because he has more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. The story we're going to look at takes place in the Byzantine Empire during the 9th century. A young man, Michael III, found himself at the throne of the Byzantine Empire. He was already declared co-ruler by his father Theophilus, but his father would die while Michael was only two years old. His mother, Theodora, would be banished to a monastery and Theoktikos, who was a leading official, was killed. He was a eunuch as declared by several historic texts, which means he had been castrated, no balls. But Bardas, who was Michael's uncle and leader of this conspiracy to rid Theodora of her throne and replace her with Michael, had accused him of wanting to marry her or one of her daughters. Michael was in a very precarious situation now. The man who had put him to the throne was his uncle Bardas, who was very intelligent, but he also conspired against his mother, he was inexperienced as a ruler, and everyone surrounding him had took part in the conspiracy. Michael decided to get counsel that he could trust, and what better than his best friend Basilius, also known as Basil I or the Macedonian. Basilius was head of the royal stables. He just tended to the horses and had no knowledge or experience in politics or the government. The way they met was that some years prior, Michael had visited the stables after a horse got loose and Basilius, who was from a peasant family, basically saved his life. He was brave and strong. Those traits impressed Michael, who promoted Basilius from just being a horse trainer to head of the royal stables. He would always be showering him with gifts and doing him favors, sending him to the best school in Byzantium, and he became one of the elite. You could say Basilius owed him everything. Everyone surrounding Michael kept telling him to give the position to Bardas, who was far more qualified to handle it, but he didn't take heed to their words and besides, he could just train Basilius for the job. He was right. Basilius learned quick and began advising Michael on all matters of the state, but Basilius had some expensive taste for someone who came from peasantry. There was no such thing as enough money for him, and after being exposed to the court life, he wanted more and more. And Michael granted it. He doubled, then tripled his salary, 
ennobled him, and married him to his own mistress. He knew that keeping his closest and most trustworthy friend satisfied was worth more than any money. Bardas was head of the army, and Basilius began to put whispers into the ears of Michael that Bardas was hopelessly ambitious. Bardas had started a conspiracy to successfully put Michael on the throne because he believed he could control his nephew. So who's to say that he wouldn't conspire against him now and take the throne for himself? Michael eventually agreed and had his uncle killed. During a horse race, Basilius would close in on Bardas in the crowd and stab him to death. Soon after asking Michael if he could replace Bardas as head of the army, that way he could oversee everything and make sure nobody was going to rebel against the emperor, and Michael granted it to him. From here, Basilius' power and wealth multiplied, but some years later Michael, who had his own expensive habits, he is the emperor after all, was under some financial troubles. He asked Basilius if he could pay back some of the money he let him borrow over the years, and Basilius refused. And that was when he realized he messed up big time. Basilius had more money, was head of the army and the senate, and had more power than the emperor himself. It wasn't even a month later that, after a night of drinking, Michael would wake up surrounded by soldiers with Basilius watching as they stabbed him to death. He would declare himself emperor immediately after, and then ride his horse through the streets with the head of Michael at the end of a long stick. Basilius would go on to be the founder of the Macedonian dynasty, one that lasted nearly 200 years, and during which the Byzantine reached its greatest expansion since the Muslim conquests hundreds of years prior. Michael largely overestimated and put the future of his empire on the gratitude he expected from Basilius. You could say Basilius owed everything he ever had to Michael, and you would be right, but even after that, he would get anything he requested. But he created an insatiable desire within Basilius, who forgot all the favors he received and began to believe that he earned all of this success on his own. Michael even had the chance to kill Basilius when he refused to give him money, but he just held out, believing that the old stable boy was somewhere inside this new man, and it cost him his life and kingdom. The media example that came to my mind is that of Jay-Z and Rockefeller Records, mainly his relationship with Dame Dash. Dame Dash has always and still is a hothead. His older brother Bobby Dash is quoted as saying, As a kid, I always knew he'd do pretty much something. When we saw Superman, the little nigga was asking questions every two minutes. When he was like 16, 17, and I got in trouble with the crack game, I always called on him to get me out of the jam. Dame was expelled from multiple schools but was really smart on standardized tests. He even got to attend some private schools, albeit very briefly. He attended the Dwight School, Isaac Newton, Manhattan Center, South Kent, which at the time was a boarding school in Connecticut that had a reputation as a school for kids with disciplinary problems, and also where he had success as an athlete, lettering in football, basketball, and lacrosse. And lastly, Westside High. Dame Dash said, Westside was for everybody that got kicked out of the place you went when you got kicked out of someplace else. And he even managed to get expelled from there after driving his car to school and parking in the principal spot. At least he ended up getting his GED though, right? He ended up selling drugs and doing a bunch of different things from sweeping floors of barbershops to selling newspapers. Hustling, as he would call it. But he quit after seeing too many deaths. He then tried his hand at being a promoter. Him and a group of friends started a small business throwing parties and promoting clubs, and one night he made an announcement that the first hundred girls in line at the club opening would get free bottles of Moet and Chandon champagne. There was a line around the block hours before the doors opened, and although this promotion lost money, he got the reputation of being the go-to promoter in his area. He realized he could use these same methods to promote music artists, and even had the idea for a clothing line, but there were a couple of roadblocks in the way. Dame didn't make any music, he couldn't rap, couldn't write rhymes, couldn't produce a beat, and didn't even have a good ear at the time. But he was a hustler, so he wasn't going to let all that stop him. In 1990, his cousin Darian Dash invited him to a party for Heavy D, and Dame said, and I quote, I looked around and saw that all the people there were older than me. They had money, and they looked like they were trying to be like me and my crew, he says. I knew I could make money from this, and make money he did. He began to manage Future Sound and got the group a record deal with Atlantic. The executive who signed them named Rodolfo Franklin, who went by the name Clark Kent, or DJ Clark Kent, and had his ear to the streets. In 1994, Clark Kent alerted Dame Dash that he had to meet with a former drug dealer from Brooklyn who was trying to get his career as a rapper off the ground. Dame was in awe of his talent. 
He said he was the fastest rapper he ever heard and never wrote anything down, just rhyming from his memory. And Jay-Z wasn't rapping about violent crime as much as popular rappers like Pac and Snoop Dogg. His lyrics were heavily focused on a lavish lifestyle full of females, yachts, champagne, money, and foreign cars. Jay-Z had tried and failed to get his own record deal and some say it was because he was too old and didn't appear thug or hard enough. He didn't fit that same persona of rappers like Notorious B.I.G. Dame didn't think that was limiting him. Everybody thought he was too old. They didn't like the way he dressed, like a Harlem dude. He wore Nike Airs, which everybody called Uptowns. The Brooklyn cats who were more dominant were known for things like gold teeth, much more ghetto. I was shocked. Here was a guy with the same aspirations that I had. We wanted to be known for making money. All we talked about was making money and how to spend it, what the best of everything was and how bad we wanted it. Dame put up money for him to record a handful of songs, but they couldn't find a record label to sign them, so he pressed the discs himself and started selling them out of his car, the birth of Rockefeller Records. The name Rockefeller Records is sort of a double entendre in itself. It was in reference to John D. Rockefeller, arguably the richest American of all time with an estimated net worth in today's money of several hundred billion, as well as a famous Brooklyn drug dealer named Rockefeller that Jay-Z looked up to as a young drug dealer. He's referenced in Nas' diss track to Jay-Z, Ether, in which he raps, Rockefeller died of AIDS, that was the end of his chapter, and that's the guy I'll chose to name your company after. Dame wanted to get on radio and needed to get a music video as soon as possible, but there was no money. Dame got an investment from the soon-to-be third partner and founder of Rockefeller, Kareem Biggs Burke. Dame took that $16,000 investment and put it all into producing a music video for the song In My Lifetime on the island of St. Thomas with 16mm film and a boat borrowed from a friend with a scene that was the visual of what Jay-Z's lyrics represented. The song was released with distribution from Payday Records. Jay-Z's first album, Reasonable Doubt, was released independently by Rockefeller Records through Priority Records, and it debuted at number 23 on the Billboard 200, but charted for 18 weeks. It wasn't an immediate success first week, but grew and grew in popularity. It was very different from the West Coast rap music that was dominating. Jay-Z's rapping style had more of a finesse to it, and far better wordplay and rhymes. Record labels were now lining up to sign, but Dame Dash had some serious demands. And that was that Rockefeller was going to maintain ownership of Jay-Z's master recordings, which means they own the catalog and continue to make money off it. Almost every record deal that's signed involves an artist selling the rights and ownership of their music to the label, even today. Most of them denied this, but one small label was willing to agree, and that was Freeze Records. This was soon sold for a low price to Russell Simmons and Lior Cohen's Def Jam Records after suffering some money problems. Russell Simmons and Lior Cohen got to work pushing Reasonable Doubt, and it sold over 1.5 million copies in the first year. Then a year later, Jay's In My Lifetime Volume 1 would sell another 1.5 million copies. Jay-Z would get elevated to another level on his appearance on Biggie Small's Life After Death album, referencing Dame Dash and Rockefeller in his verse. And in 1998, Jay-Z's Hard Knock Life went on to sell 12 million copies worldwide. This made Rockefeller Records the most important label at Def Jam, and still mainly one star. In 1997, Def Jam would buy a 50% stake in Rockefeller for $1.5 million that would be renegotiated later on to $20 million. Some of the early signees to the label were Noriega, M.O.P., DJ Clue, Irv Gotti and Murder Inc., Emil, Beanie Siegel, and later on Cameron. In 1999, Rockefeller would go on a 54-city tour, headlined by Jay-Z, called the Hard Knock Life Tour, with supporting acts from the label like Memphis Bleak, Beanie Siegel, DJ Clue, and Emil, but also rappers DMX, Method Man, Red Man, and Ja Rule. The tour would generate over $20 million in profits, and Dame Dash even produced a documentary for it titled Backstage, released in 2000, that shows both live performances and an in-depth look at what happens backstage. Iceberg was an Italian luxury fashion house started in 1974 that were focused on knitwear. Jay-Z shouted them out a handful of times in the 90s in lines that people thought were usually just a reference to Iceberg Slim the Pimp, but when their sales started going up, him and Dame decided to reach out to see if they could do an endorsement deal, but they were denied. They said screw it and made their own. In 1999, Dame Dash would launch a clothing line along with Jay-Z called Rockaware. They would license their clothes to be sold as socks, sandals, headwear, 
jewelry, sunglasses, children's clothes, you name it. Dame is quoted as saying, The music business isn't so profitable, especially not hip-hop. I couldn't buy what I wanted to buy. I'm talking cooks and drivers. I got into clothes to make more money. There's a lot of slices of the pie going on when it came to music, even back then, though it sold more. There were high copyright fees for sampling songs and then splitting the remaining profits with all who had a share left you with crumbs. But with his knowledge of style, Dame helped make Rockaware a massive success, but not without the help of the now star, Jay-Z. This taught them a huge lesson in one of Jay-Z's key philosophies, which is to never promote brands or products that aren't his own. Him and Dame would also launch Armadale Vodka, and in damn near every music video, Jay-Z would be wearing Rockaware clothing and showing the vodka somewhere, causing it to always sell out. Most rappers still haven't learned this lesson. Instead opting to wear brands like Supreme in their music videos, that doesn't pay them a dime when they can be wearing their own merchandise. Armadale Vodka would end up flopping in the mid-2000s, but Rockaware was so hugely successful, just in the year 2000, it had sales of over 50 million, and would peak in the future to 700 million. The 2000s was the turn of the millennium, and where trouble in paradise was soon to come. Dame Dash started companies left and right, signing new artists, one of which being Kanye West who he discovered. Rockaware is pulling several hundred million in sales. Everything seemed great, but Dame's habits weren't really that of a focused boss, but something else entirely. Jay-Z wasn't too happy with the way Dame was conducting himself in the media, his massive ego, and all these businesses he was doing. Some behind Jay's back, like giving Cameron his own imprint at the record label. Dame would frequently wild out, screaming out at record executives and employees, fire dozens of executives, and continuously burn bridges, complain that there were meetings behind his back, and saying that Jay-Z was now harder to reach. Jay-Z had the respect of Lior Cohen and the employees of the record label. He was Basilius and now Dame Dash was looking around like Michael did. The news got out that Jay-Z was going to retire from rap after the Black Album. Dame made a movie titled Death of a Dynasty, which was supposed to be a joke about all the rumors spreading, but it turned out to be true. Dame likely saw the writing on the wall and was assembling his team so he wouldn't have to rely on Jay. He said, At a certain point, I got ready to depend on my other artists. I started putting together an army. Kanye, Cameron, Beanie, The Diplomats. I figured Jay gave me time to prepare. Another was a promotional campaign for Rockaware he wanted $3 million for. I designed Rockaware. I brought the lifestyle upscale, says Dame. Like getting Naomi Campbell and Victoria Beckham to wear it, going to Sundance to promote it. I had an ad campaign planned with Naomi and Kevin Bacon. It was so fly it could be in vogue. They just wanted Jay in there and to let some cheap photographer do it. All of a sudden, Jay's voting with those two, the two being Russian businessmen who were silent partners. I had to go to Mario Testino and say, I can't do this because my partners are too cheap. I felt ghetto. It seemed that Dame cared a lot more about what these people thought about him than the business. Jay-Z was a superstar and selling Rockaware fine on his own. He was wearing the clothes for free. What the hell is the point of wasting $3 million when you had one of the best people to promote it as your business partner? On December 24th, 2004, Jay-Z asked Dame to meet him at the now defunct Da Silvano, an Italian restaurant in Manhattan, for dinner. Dame had already agreed along with Kareem and Jay-Z to sell the remaining 50% of their label to Def Jam for $10 million, each of them taking $3 million. But he was surprised to hear that Jay-Z was going to be promoted to president of Def Jam. I said, go ahead and take the money and the job, but don't take the name. Don't take Rockefeller with you, Dame recalls. I didn't say please, but I might as well have. Jay-Z offered him to keep the name if Dame would relinquish his possession of the master recordings for Jay-Z's debut album, Reasonable Doubt, and Dame wouldn't agree to it. Everybody that was signed to Rockefeller was given the chance to either stay with Jay-Z at Def Jam or go with Dame to his new label, and most artists decided to stay with Jay-Z, most notably Kanye West, who Dame had found in the first place. Dame is quoted as saying, He said, it's business, but we were always supposed to be about more than business, Jay especially. I did everything I possibly could so that he didn't have to raise his voice. He just had to whisper something in my ear, and I'd take care of it. The people I fought with to make money for him, Lior Cohen and Kevin Lyles, he's made friends with. He hangs out with Puff now. It's like if your brother leaves you. Let's stop right there. Does that not sound exactly like the story we covered earlier in this video? It's damn near the same thing that happened between Emperor Michael and Basilius, yet it was well over 1,000 years ago. 
Some of you commented on the first video that a lot of these concepts are outdated, but there's no such thing. These are based on human nature, which hasn't changed since the dawn of man, as we can see here. The artist that went with Dane began to flop on the charts, and his record label venture quickly ended. The only thing still connecting him with Jay-Z was the 25% he owned in Rockaware, which would eventually lead Dame to being invited to a meeting in a hotel room in New York. And when he asked why they were meeting at a hotel room instead of the offices, the partners told him, so no one will hear you scream. Dash was kicked out of the company with a $22 million buyout that he only ended up getting $7 million in cash. To put salt on the wound, Jay-Z would end up selling the rights to Rockaware to the Iconics brand group for over $200 million while still keeping his stake in the company. Jay-Z finally got the crown and beheaded his former best friend. It's really easy to say Basilius was an ungrateful snake, mostly because we don't have more details from the story, and some might and still do say the same about Jay-Z. I'm not among them though because while I do draw parallels between these stories, I think it's more nuanced than Jay-Z just turning his back on his friend. But I also don't think Jay-Z is some saint, as I have been critical of him in the past. Just tell me if you would stay working with someone like Dame Dash after hearing some of the things he was doing. He had a personal assistant and an executive assistant, two phones and his assistant had to charge six batteries, a chef, a bodyguard, and someone auditioning to be his butler. Not too many people understand how important having a butler is. I need somebody to help me get everything I'm going to wear for the day all set up. Know what I'm saying? You'd think it's easy, but I've got a lot to put together, accessory-wise, especially at night. Cufflinks are a mother effer. He had a house in Beverly Hills and a Tribeca loft. He had a three-bedroom closet in which the dressing room and sneaker room each had their own bathroom. He had a wall of shelves just for t-shirts and socks that he only ever wore once and then donated to charity. That way, somebody gets to own basically new stuff and I got to be fly, he says. That same philosophy went for his sneakers, which he had over 1,300 pairs. He had a separate Nike closet from his Adidas closet. I get pretty much every cool sneaker that comes out. I used to prefer Nikes, but then in 2004, I bought Pro Kids. He had a $400,000 Maybach, that there were less than a thousand in America. On an episode he had with MTV Cribs with Kanye West with him, he takes them on a tour of his home that might be the most ego-driven and obnoxiously braggadocious episode of that series. There was the MTV cameraman, but there was also two other cameramen in the house at the time. One was Dame's full-time videographer, who he hired to record everything he did throughout the day, and the second guy was the videographer in charge of recording the first videographer. This ain't no damn joke. He had five different clothing and shoe companies. A Swiss watch company, a vodka company, a television production company, and a movie production company. Average people might think this is impressive, but anyone in their right mind knows that it's impossible to run all these businesses successfully. Most successful people do one thing. Does any of this behavior in public and the media sound like that of an executive? Jay-Z right now isn't doing this. No labels executives do this stuff. It's what you would expect from young rappers and athletes, maybe, but Dame was in his mid-30s when this was happening. I wouldn't want to work with someone this self-absorbed and obsessed with his image. Beanie Siegel spoke out saying that he believes Jay-Z got tired of Dame's behavior in front of the media and at business meetings with executives. He was spending company money on other business ventures, and Jay wanted him to play more of a behind-the-scenes silent role, like Kareem or other business partners. But no, Dame wanted to be the star, and he has never, and will never, take accountability. And it's no surprise that some years later, Dame Dash was pretty much broke, but even worse, in millions of dollars in debt to the IRS and other people. Only a couple of years ago, he was selling Jay-Z plaques and his shoe collection on eBay, of course denied it, saying it was stuff that he had in storage, someone else was selling it. But it doesn't change the fact that the Tribeca loft he had was foreclosed on in 2010, with $7.3 million left on the mortgages. He lost a bunch of lawsuits from landlords, fashion designer Charlotte Ronson, and a celebrity bodyguard firm. His leased SUV was seized in 2008 after he missed a monthly payment of $715. He'll still put on the appearance that he's rich and doing fine, but... The truth is, Jay-Z is damn near a billionaire now, and the man who was responsible for putting him in the star position he had as an artist is struggling. Dame was the brains behind the Rockaware brand because, if you haven't noticed, ever since Jay-Z and Dame split, Jay's outfits have been horrendous, but to be fair, he mainly just wears suits now. Michael thought all he did for Basilius was going to keep him loyal to him, and Dame Dash thought all he did and the friendship was going to keep Jay-Z loyal to him, 
but he overestimated his ability to stay loyal to such an insufferable personality. But let me know in the comments what you think. Should Jay-Z have stuck it out with Dame and was messed up for leaving him, or was he right to cut him off? As always, we have to look at the reversal of the law, which states, Although it is generally best not to mix work with friendship, there are times when a friend can be used to greater effect than an enemy. A man of power, for example, often has dirty work that has to be done. But for the sake of appearances, it is generally preferable to have other people do it for him. Friends often do this best since their affection for him makes them willing to take chances. Also, if your plans go awry for some reason, you can use a friend as a convenient scapegoat. This fall of the favorite was a trick often used by kings and sovereigns. They would let their closest friend at court take the fall for a mistake, since the public would not believe that they would deliberately sacrifice a friend for such a purpose. Of course, after you play that card, you have lost your friend forever. It is best then to reserve the scapegoat role for someone who is close to you, but not too close. Finally, the problem about working with friends is that it confuses the boundaries and distances that working requires. But if both partners in the arrangement understand the dangers involved, a friend can often be employed to great effect. You must never let your guard down in such a venture, however. Always be on the lookout for any signs of emotional disturbance, such as envy and ingratitude. Nothing is stable in the realm of power, and even the closest of friends can be transformed into the worst of enemies. There are plenty of examples of scapegoats when it comes to the rap game, but one that happened recently, well, a couple of years ago, was involving Young Thug. Back in 2015, there was a very heated conflict between Birdman and Young Thug, who were close, and Lil Wayne. So much so that in April of that year, Lil Wayne's tour bus got shot up. The shooter was Pee Wee Roscoe of Bankroll Mafia, who was Birdman's tour manager, and he had called Birdman on the phone prior to and after the incident. The phone call even leaked in 2018, with Birdman saying, It's time for you to come out here and get your money. Man, you done did everything you could do. It's an eye-opener, bruh. Strictly business, man. And in the phone records, it shows Young Thug calling him 12 times before the incident. He ended up eating the charge and getting 10 years. There's more to it, but that's for another video. Birdman and Young Thug get away and are free because Roscoe took the charge for them. And of course, him and his family would be taken care of. But this is a perfect example of a scapegoat or a fall man. Today we're going to talk about Kanye West pooping on Drake. Law 3 is conceal your intentions. Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you're up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. How does this law relate to Kanye West and Drake? And this story is from when Drake went on LeBron James HBO show The Shop, where they discussed the Pusha T beef and why Drake was throwing shots at Kanye afterwards. Drake shares a lot of information that the public was previously in the dark about, and if it is true then, Kanye is capable of a lot more than I thought because I would have never expected him to move like this. Drake says that he linked up in the studio with Kanye, and Ye was telling him how much of a great place he was in, that he was happy to be a father with a new son, and that he wants to be like Quincy Jones and help Drake continue to be successful. But in order for that to happen, Drake needed to be transparent with him. Drake usually doesn't play people his music early or tell others when he's releasing music, which is why his music almost never leaks. But Kanye told him that there needs to be trust between them, and he would have to play his music early for Kanye, and also let him know when he planned on releasing his next album. Even though Drake doesn't like doing that, he thought it was a reasonable request, and he trusted Kanye. He played him some music, told him that he was planning on releasing his album in June of 2018, and that everything was all good. Kanye played the Lift Yourself beat for Drake, who really liked it. Ye told him that he could have the instrumental to that song and Drake immediately began writing to it, or having someone write for him, which some of you are probably thinking, whichever you want to believe. Kanye told Drake, man, you gotta pull up to Wyoming and link up, then hit some studio sessions, making it seem like he was going to help Drake out some more with his music. Noah Shabib, also known as 40, Drake's producer, flew out to Wyoming a day early, and hit up Drake telling him that something was off about all of this. He told him that he felt like Kanye wasn't really trying to help Drake out on his album, but was working on his own album. Drake gave him the benefit of the doubt and said, nah, he told me he was just working on beats and had no plans of dropping an album until at least October, if not November. Drake shows up to Wyoming, and the entire time he was there, was working on Kanye's music and cooking up ideas for him. He didn't explicitly say it, but 
It was suggested that he wrote for him as well while there, and when the time came for him to leave Wyoming, he really had nothing but a lift yourself beat and a pat on the back. Drake played March 14th for Kanye and also told him that he was having trouble dealing with his son's mother, and sends him a picture of his son, a very private and personal conversation with information that wasn't made public yet. He still wasn't completely disappointed because he had a good beat, but one day he wakes up and sees that Kanye made all these release dates for the good music signees at the end of May and throughout all of June, exactly surrounding the release date Drake said he was planning for his album. It still wasn't enough to send him over the edge, but Kanye sends him a message telling him how much he appreciates Drake, but then next day releases Lift Yourself or Poopity Scoop, where Kanye just absolutely trolls, ruins a great beat, and it seemed like a joke to everyone in the public at the time. But it was like sending a diss directly to the person who was meant to receive it. At the time, nobody knew Drake had the Lift Yourself beat. So by releasing it in the fashion he did, it was like Kanye giving a big screw you to Drake and he was the only one who knew about it. This upset Drake and he fell back, feeling used. But then Pusha T drops his album and there's a diss song towards him produced by Kanye and talking about having writers when he was just in Wyoming helping Kanye with writing for his album. This was one of the first times Drake was really caught off guard, admittedly. He said it took him four days just to register what had happened. He was in a daze and wasn't sure what the hell to do next. This was some next level mind games by Kanye West, if true, and he really bent the public perception afterwards to Drake being a big bully and Kanye West just wanting peace and framing himself as the victim. I still don't know who was telling the truth. The story relates to one in Law 3 of which there are two parts. Part 1 is, use decoyed objects of desire and red herrings to throw people off the scent. If at any point in the deception you practice, people have the slightest suspicion as to your intentions, all is lost. Do not give them the chance to sense what you are up to. Throw them off the scent by dragging red herrings across the path. Use false sincerity, send ambiguous signals, set up misleading objects of desire. Unable to distinguish the genuine from the false, they cannot pick out your real goal. In 1850, Otto von Bismarck was a 35-year-old deputy in the Prussian parliament and at a crossroads in his career. The problem was unifying different states into the divided Germany in a war against the neighboring Austria which wanted to keep them weak and at odds with each other, threatening them if they tried to unite. Prince William wanted to go to war. The parliament agreed to give him troops, and the people wanted it too. The ones who opposed the war were the current king, Frederick William IV, and his ministers, who wanted to keep the powerful Austrians happy. Bismarck throughout his entire career dreamed of unifying Germany, leading them to war against Austria, and not just beating them, but humiliating them. He was a former soldier and believed in warfare, having said, the great questions of the time will be decided not by speeches and resolutions, but by iron and blood. He was a patriot and soldier, but he gave a speech that shocked everyone. Woe unto the statesman, who makes war without a reason that will still be valid when the war is over. After the war, you will all look differently at these questions. Will you then have the courage to turn to the peasant contemplating the ashes of his farm, to the man who has been crippled, to the father who has lost his children? He was speaking against the war. And more than that, he was praising Austria and defending them. Many deputies were confused and started changing their votes, and the war was avoided entirely. A few weeks later, the king who was happy he sided with him made him a cabinet minister. And a few years later, he became the Prussian premier, a role in which he would lead his country to war against Austria, crushing them, and establishing the German state with Prussia as its head. Bismarck knew what he was doing with his speech. He knew that the Prussian military, his own people, weren't ready for war, and that it was likely Austria would win at that point in time. And if he had supported the war and they lost, his career would be ruined. The king and ministers wanted peace, and Bismarck wanted power, which they had, so he supported them and fooled his entire country. It was this speech and deception that allowed for him to get the power and position necessary to strengthen the Prussian army and go to war. If he told the people that they should wait until later to go to war, they wouldn't have listened, and probably think he was weak. They mistakenly believed their army was stronger and wanted war at that moment. And if he told the king that he would support him for position of power, then the king wouldn't trust them since it wouldn't come across as sincere. It was like he was trying to get something out of him. 
If we're to do some guessing with the Kanye situation, it's likely that Pusha T had been planning on dissing Drake for a very long time on his album. It would be great promotion for it, and it was. And Pusha has been throwing jabs at Drake for years. But Kanye didn't want to just make it obvious that he was trying to take down Drake. Because then Drake would have time to prepare. He led Drake into believing that he really cared about his music, his family, and his career so much that he gave him all of this valuable information that was private and would go on to be used by Pusha T in the first beef that Drake lost. Drake is someone who is usually always planning and ready for everything, but he even said this time he was left in a daze for days with no idea what to do next. This wouldn't have been possible if it were made apparent that Kanye was out to get Drake. The situations aren't exactly the same between Otto von Bismarck and Kanye, but the methods they used are identical. One of the quotes from this book that I really like goes like this. Many believe that by being honest and open, they are winning people's hearts and showing their good nature. They are greatly deluded. Honesty is actually a blunt instrument, which bloodies more than it cuts. Your honesty is likely to offend people. It is much more prudent to tailor your words, telling people what they want to hear, rather than the coarse and ugly truth of what you feel or think. More important, by being unabashedly open, you make yourself so predictable and familiar that it is almost impossible to respect or fear you and power will not accrue to a person who cannot inspire such emotions. This was a little odd to me because Kanye was known as being honest and pretty much an open book to people, but when I read further, you get to the reversal, which is available in every law. None of these laws are true 100% of the time, so there's always a situation in which the opposite is valued. No smokescreen, red herring, false sincerity, or any other diversionary device will succeed in concealing your intentions if you have already have an established reputation for deception. And as you get older and achieve success, it often becomes increasingly difficult to disguise your cunning. Everyone knows you practice deception, persist in playing naive, and you run the risk of seeming the rankest hypocrite, which will severely limit your room to maneuver. In such cases, it is better to own up, to appear the honest rogue, or better, the repentant rogue. Not only will you be admired for your frankness, but most wonderful and strange of all, you will be able to continue your stratagems. This is why Kanye's plan worked. Because he had a reputation for being honest and never doing anything deceptive. There are certain individuals and artists that are known for always deceiving or lying, which I usually say is a bad idea to do to your fan base. And whenever something really bad happens, nobody believes them. Like when Adam22 had someone pull up with a gun to a show. Everyone thought it was staged. And I'm not really sure if he's always lying to his fans, but even after the police showed up, people were saying that, yeah, this is still staged. Or when 6 9 got jumped and his jewelry robbed, people thought it was a promotional stunt for his music video that was dropping. But when it came to Kanye, Drake didn't think he would be capable of something like this. And even after he spoke on it on LeBron's show, many people still don't believe Kanye did any of this. And Drake was either lying or severely exaggerating the story. But let me know in the comments, do you think that Kanye West really did all of this? Or was Drake lying or exaggerating? Or possibly Pusha T gave him instructions for how to approach Drake. Even for me, this whole story behind what happened is so hard to believe from both sides. Law 4 is always say less than necessary. When you're trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear, and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended, and sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. Ever since J. Cole really catapulted to superstar status, he said a lot less than he used to and lets both his actions and music speak for itself. The only interviews he's done recently is the one with Lil Pump and the other with Angie Martinez. Other than that, he stays away from all the things that star rappers are expected to be doing. He rarely ever tweets or posts on social media, and this makes his words much more powerful when he does decide to speak. But actions speak louder than words, and we're going to look at both today. For instance, politics is an easy way to win points as a rapper. You just support whatever most of rap listeners are supporting, and you seem like a revolutionary. But J. Cole has said he tries to steer clear of politics. In a Billboard interview, after being asked why he doesn't speak on Twitter about politics, he's quoted as saying, I might not be on Twitter at that time. I might not be in the mode of confidently expressing my opinions via text. I speak better from the heart, out loud. And when it really moves me, I'll do it. But politics really doesn't interest me anymore. 
I try to stay as far away from politics as possible. I don't click the links, the headlines are enough. I understand there is a segment of politics where you have people, and this is the part I respect, who truly are trying to use it as a tool for change, and they devote their life to grassroots voter registration and stuff like that. They're living a life that's unselfish. But the politics we're talking about is Trump headlines. And when asked if he had campaigned for anyone, he said no, because I don't care to lend my voice for a politician at the end of the day. But that doesn't mean J. Cole doesn't care about social issues. On the contrary, he's been present at several protests. One of them was in 2014 at the protest for Eric Garner, who was killed by police officers choking him, and that same year being present at Ferguson, Missouri for the Mike Brown protest. In 2015, he attended the Million Man March in Washington, D.C., and speaking about protesting, he says, I love it in the sense that I'm providing something to you. I'm serving you. It's a real connection. But when it's the world grabbing at it, I didn't give you that. I didn't authorize it. You're just addicted to the drama and the gossip. The difference between J. Cole and other rappers or entertainers is he never advertised or posted on social media that he was attending any of these protests or marches. He never took pictures and sent out the message of, hey, look at me, I really care about people, in order to win points with the fans. It was his own fans that took pictures or people that recognized him and videos of him and then uploading them, ironically getting him more respect from the fans because he wasn't doing what every other rapper is doing and trying to use these issues to advance his own career. But there are instances where Cole lends his voice to a cause, and when he does his words are brief but powerful. Like when he visited San Quentin State Prison to talk to the inmates. Plenty of rappers are yelling free whoever, but have never done anything like that, also wearing a prison jumper during a performance of his. He went on Twitter to suggest people to protest the NFL in 2017, telling everyone that they have the power to deny them their attention, but barely anybody was willing to give up their beloved American football. In a world where rappers and entertainers have the well-deserved reputation of being liars and deceivers, J. Cole stands out because when he says something is happening, it's happening. He doesn't tease his album for months and then have multiple delays. When he releases, it's on that date, if not the same day with a surprise release, which he's done several times. He gives off the message of being a man of the people, and it reflects in his music. His music is geared towards regular people and their struggles. And to be able to relate to them on the level that he does, he needs to live that lifestyle as well. Sure, he may not be experiencing the same struggles now, but like he said, he doesn't live a celebrity lifestyle. He plays ball in the park, he goes to regular stores, he sees real people every day and interacts with them. While some artists may have originally started this way, once they make some money, they alienate themselves from regular folk and can no longer connect with them. J. Cole says significantly less than most artists, but has much more influence than most of them combined. But there's also a good reason for not doing long form interviews or saying much. That's because the more you talk, the more opportunities you give for people to misrepresent your words. On interview platforms such as The Breakfast Club, Hot 97, or most others, they're looking for a headline that is usually one that makes the interviewee look bad. And while these platforms show respect to people like J. Cole, it doesn't mean that fans that are watching, or haters, won't take some words he said out of context and use it to paint him as a terrible person. One example being when he showed support to XXXTentacion after he died, and many were saying he was sympathizing with an abuser. Intentional or not, J. Cole is using this law and benefiting from it. Whenever he speaks it's in few words that seem profound and everybody gathers around to listen because it's not something that happens every day. A story in the chapter, where a man had followed the same principles as J. Cole but failed because of his own mouth, is the story of Coriolanus who was a military hero in ancient Rome. He won so many important battles that saved the city and he became somewhat of a legend since the regular people never saw him. In the middle of the 5th century he decided to try his hand at politics for the position of consul. Instead of giving a speech like most had done before him, all he did was remove his garments and show the people the dozens of scars he had gotten from over 17 years of fighting in wars for Rome. Nobody really cared much for the speech he delivered afterwards. They were already convinced. The scars were all the proof they needed. The day came for voting and Coriolanus pulled up escorted by the whole senate, the city's patricians, and the aristocracy. The common folk who were going to vote for him saw this as such a display of arrogance when election day wasn't even over yet. He made another speech, but this time it only addressed the rich people. He claimed that his victory was certain, bragged about his accomplishments in the battlefield, and talked about the riches he would bring Rome. People were paying attention and had no idea that the man they were going to vote for and thought was a hero was such an arrogant and self-centered braggart. News spread quick, and voter turnout was high to make sure he didn't win, and he lost. 
he returned to the military and wanted vengeance on the regular people who voted against him. When a shipment of grain arrived in Rome, the Senate intended on distributing it to the people for free, but right before that, Coriolanus appeared and argued that it would have a harmful effect on the city and had several senators reconsidering. But he also spoke out against democracy as a whole. He wanted to get rid of the people's right to vote. This time when news spread, the people were angrier than ever before. They demanded to the Senate that Coriolanus come before them, and when he refused, riots broke out all over the city, and the Senate finally voted in favor of distributing the grain. The people's anger was quelled, but they still wanted an apology. If he gave one and kept his opinions to himself, they would let him return to the battlefield. He came before the people and started his speech slowly and softly, but over time showed his arrogance again and began insulting the people. The longer his speech went on, the angrier they became, and finally the Tribune voted to condemn him to death. But the patricians felt this too extreme, and instead just sent him to exile for the rest of his life. People were celebrating in the streets more than they ever celebrated when an actual enemy was defeated. Here was a man that had his position sealed, his first entry into politics, but he ruined it by opening his mouth. He had won the respect of the people and was known as a legend for his actions, his triumphs in war. He was a mysterious figure, but the more he talked, the less mystery there was and less respect. If he had spoken less and only necessary words, they would have never known his true feelings and he would have been in the position to achieve his goal of ruining the democracy. Many rappers have made the same mistake Coriolanus did. They might have been great rappers, but when interviewed and asked questions about different things, they seem dumb to the general public. But as always, there is a reversal to this law, and it states, There are times when it is unwise to be silent. Silence can arouse suspicion and even insecurity, especially in your superiors. A vague or ambiguous comment can open you up to interpretations you had not bargained for. Silence and saying less than necessary must be practiced with caution, then and in the right situations. It is occasionally wiser to imitate the court jester, who plays the fool but knows he is smarter than the king. He talks and talks and entertains, and no one suspects that he is more than just a fool. Also, words can sometimes act as a kind of smokescreen for any deception you might practice. By bending your listener's ear with talk, you can distract and mesmerize them. The more you talk, in fact, the less suspicious of you they become. The verbose are not perceived as sly and manipulative, but as helpless and unsophisticated. This is the reverse of the silent policy employed by the powerful. By talking more and making yourself appear weaker and less intelligent than your mark, you can practice deception with greater ease. This almost never applies to music artists because they're already in a position of power. Most of them benefit from not saying too much. Today we're going to talk about logic, in particular, and how well he's able to follow Law 5, which is as follows. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. Reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone, you can intimidate and win. Once it slips, however, you are vulnerable and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes in their own reputations. Then stand aside and let public opinion hang them. Logic employs this very well. If you ask the general audience of people who have heard of him, they'll probably tell you Logic's reputation is being biracial. But on a real note, it's a phrase that he always says time and time again, and it's peace, love, and positivity. He says it on his biggest hit song, 1-800, and has been saying it for years. It's a part of his reputation, which means that he can't really be as aggressive as other rappers or get himself into beef because it's not the reputation he's built for himself. Logic has done an excellent job guarding this reputation, even though he's done some things that people would consider outside of peace, love, and positivity. Two of those people being rappers IDK from Logic's home state of Maryland and Joyner Lucas from Massachusetts. Earlier this year, IDK released his song Trigger Happy, where he raps, Logic and his manager trying to ruin my deal. I guess that's what happens when you tell a nigga who spent his whole career proving that he's black that he ain't black still. The line he's talking about is in a previous track titled 365 Freestyle that he deleted, where he raps, the last nigga that made it isn't actually black, in reference to his state of Maryland, when talking about rappers from there. For the one where he says he isn't black, it was really unprovoked, taking shots at Logic for no reason, and it makes you come across as salty, especially when he's from the same area as you. But for the more recent one, it was an accusation that Logic and his manager tried to ruin the potential record deal that IDK had in the works. IDK is likely sure that Logic wouldn't respond to him, so he continues by rapping, 
But when you taking food out of my fridge, I ain't gotta chill. And that for real, this ain't a diss, he won't respond, this ain't a risk. This is me saying none of you bigger artists can cock block shit. IDK mentioned Logic in a derogatory way before he ever allegedly tried to sabotage his deal. So I don't know why he says he ain't gotta chill now like he was innocent and was chilling before. And Logic was just a big bad wolf trying to hold him back. It's clearly a diss. And he says he won't respond, but he truly wishes he did respond. It's almost like when you tell your friends, oh nah, you won't do that. It's a different way of telling them, do that. I think IDK is a good rapper. But trying to frame himself as a victim here isn't really effective considering the situation. But if Logic and his manager did do this, then that would be pretty out of character for someone about peace, love, and positivity, right? That person should be able to just ignore whether or not some random rapper out of their radar thinks of their race. Joyner, Lucas, and Logic actually appeared on a song together before he started throwing shots. It was a Tech 9 track titled Sriracha. Only Logic was supposed to be featured on the track initially, but he took over six months to send over his verse. Joyner Lucas got on the track. Joyner voices disappointments for Logic with a verse that took him six months on his Mask Off remix, rapping, And don't you compare me to Logic, go listen to Sriracha. Yeah, that's Amanda to Rhonda, and that's a Benz to a Honda. Yeah, that's a dance with the devil, and I ain't dancing behind you. Joyner said both him and Tech 9 were unhappy with Logic not giving the same fast flow that they did on the track, but Tech 9 wasn't as angry, just showing a bit of disappointment. In an interview, Tech 9 says, It's MC stuff, and he had a right to speak on it. I love Logic, that's my boy, but he knew he was supposed to chop on that song, but he was busy. He was busy touring all that year. It took like six months or something, but I was gonna wait. Joyner did it, he killed it, he did everything. I sent it to Logic and he texted me back and said, Son can rap. I talked to Joyner and I just said, Man, I wish he didn't freestyle on the track. Then there comes the controversy with Joyner and Lucas' album 508 507 2280, which was a project talking about mental health, and Joyner saying Logic copied him with his 1 800 track. Joyner tried to be careful with this, saying, Then the phone number idea. I noticed when I had dropped my album title, he dropped the phone number record. But I'm not going to bash him for a suicide record, but like, come on, bro. There's too much stuff that make me feel the type of way. I feel by now the cat should have reached out, but it is what it is. It's not like I'm mad at him like that. I just think he's corny. We've established that Logic knew who he was. And it might be possible that he took the phone number idea for a title since the song was about suicide prevention because it never mentions the number in the lyrics. I do think Logic already had the idea for the track though. That's my guess. But this becoming Logic's biggest song ever must have fueled some anger in Joyner who went on Everyday Struggle and got very loud and angry talking about Logic's manager having took the idea from him and not connecting. Logic addresses it on his song, Yuck, where he raps, Cats beef with Logic, yeah, they pray and I respond. If I ever did, I dead you in this game with no respawn. Peace, love, and positivity, that's all I want with you, but you push the issue because I give you more press than your publicist could ever get you. And he continues, The feelings of self-hatred that you want to project on me Bet if I never picked up the mic, then we might be homies. But you jealous, you look at my life and you feel envy, constantly comparing yourself to me and feel empty. Logic, of course, denies that this was aimed at Joyner, but instead of coming at him with the same energy, he suns him and takes the high road, which is the reputation he's built for himself. He even raps peace, love, and positivity on this track. And in both of these instances, both with Joyner and IDK, Logic won out. His reputation wasn't even damaged at all. This relates to a story in Law 5 where he actually succeeded where Joyner failed, and that's P.T. Barnum. He intended on becoming America's greatest showman and was willing to do anything to make it happen. He wanted to purchase the American Museum in Manhattan and turn it into a curated selection of weird presentations to gain fame. A little problem though, he had no money and the asking price was $15,000. But Barnum wasn't going to let that stop him. He put together a proposal that the owners were satisfied with and it substituted cash with guarantees and referrals. They came to an agreement, but at the last minute, the partner changed his mind, and they sold it to the directors of Peel's Museum. This got Barnum really angry, but they told him it was just business, and Peel's had a reputation that he didn't. So since he didn't have a reputation, he thought, how can I destroy Peel's? He started a letter-writing campaign in newspapers calling the owners broken-down bank directors, that had no idea how to run a museum or entertain people. He advised the public against buying their stock because the company had just bought a museum, and it would mean they would have to devote resources to it, and since they didn't know how to run one, they were going to lose money on it. And it worked. 
the stock fell so far, and the owners of the American Museum reneged on their deal and sold it to Barnum. Years later, Peels finally recovered, but they wanted vengeance on Barnum. So Mr. Peel decided to build a reputation for entertainment, rivaling that of Barnum, but promoting his music as more scientific. Hypnotism was his main attraction, and for a while it brought in some big crowds, and Barnum knew he had to destroy his reputation again. So he decided to put on his own little hypnotism show. He organized a performance where he put a little girl into a trance, and once she looks to have fallen asleep, he tries to hypnotize people in the audience. But none of them fell under the spell, and many of them started laughing. Barnum got frustrated and said to prove the girl was actually hypnotized, he would cut off one of her fingers without her noticing. The girl got up and ran away. The crowd burst into laughter. This was a parody show, so that was his intended result. And he would run it for multiple weeks until nobody was able to take his rival Peel's show seriously, and he had to close his hypnotism show. He would never recover while Barnum became known for his showmanship and antics. Barnum used both doubt and ridicule in both of these examples. He made the public doubt the ability of Peel when it came to their company's stability, and he ridiculed them when he was doing parody shows. If Joyner Lucas or IDK really wanted to bring down logic, or come at him, they would have to break down the peace, love, and positivity because that's what logic fans care about. These two guys only appealed to people who already thought logic was corny or lame, and that's pointless. That group of people already doesn't like logic, so even if they agree with you, it doesn't harm him and he doesn't lose out on anything. Now if they could sow seeds of doubt in how genuine logic was about being for peace, love, and positivity, it would get his own fans reconsidering. Some examples might be aggressive tweets in his past, perhaps him treating a fan terribly, something of the sort. Leaking it to news or gossip pages on Instagram and YouTube which will force Logic's hand at defending himself, and then he's lost. Logic made an anti-suicide song, so if there was an example of him telling someone to kill themselves as a tweet, that would hurt him really badly. And it could even be a fake tweet. People don't even bother to fact check anything anymore. If something has a lot of likes or retweets, they automatically believe it to be true. I've witnessed it too many times. But I don't suggest any of this. I don't believe in ruining people and this is just an example of how it would be done correctly. A very good quote from the chapter. Reputation is a treasure to be carefully collected and hoarded, especially when you are first establishing it. You must protect it strictly, anticipating all attacks on it. Once it is solid, do not let yourself get angry or defensive at the slanderous comments of your enemies. That reveals insecurity, not confidence in your reputation. Take the high road instead, and never appear desperate in your self-defense. This is exactly what Logic did on his verse Yuck. He took the high road in his defense, even said he gives Joyner more promo than his publicist. There's usually a reversal at the end of each chapter, but here there isn't. It reads, there is no possible reversal. Reputation is critical. There are no exceptions to this law. Perhaps, not caring what others think of you, you gain a reputation for insolence and arrogance, but that can be a valuable image in itself. Oscar Wilde used it to great advantage. Since we must live in society and must depend on the opinions of others, there is nothing to be gained by neglecting your reputation. By not caring how you are perceived, you let others decide this for you. Be the master of your fate and also of your reputation. This is one of the most important laws in this book and is one of those things you really only get one chance at. You need to know what kind of reputation you want to have and take all the necessary actions to make sure you don't falter. Today we're going to take a look at 6-9. Law 6 is court attention at all costs and reads as follows. Everything is judged by its appearance. What is unseen counts for nothing. Never let yourself get lost in the crowd then or buried in oblivion. Stand out. Be conspicuous at all costs. Make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger, more colorful, more mysterious than the bland and timid masses. There are two different parts and styles when it comes to this, but for this video we're looking at part one, which is surround your name with the sensational and scandalous. Draw attention to yourself by creating an unforgettable, even controversial image. Court scandal. Do anything to make yourself seem larger than life and shine more brightly than those around you. Make no distinction between kinds of attention. Notoriety of any sort will bring you power. Better to be slandered and attacked than ignored. Similarly to last episode, we're going to go into another story about P.T. Barnum. Barnum started off as an assistant to Aaron Turner, who was the owner of a circus. They stopped in Maryland for some performances, 
and on the morning of opening day, Barnum was walking around town in his new black suit when suddenly people started following him. Someone in that group of people yelled that he was the Reverend Ephraim K. Avery, who was a man that was acquitted of murder but believed to be guilty by most people. Think of O.J. Simpson. This angry mob of people tore apart his suit and were going to lynch him, but Barnum pleaded with them to let him convince them otherwise. He brought them to the circus where he could verify his identity, and once they got there, Turner told everyone it was all a prank. He was the one that spread the rumor that Barnum was Avery, and the crowd left him alone, but Barnum, <laughs> he wasn't too happy about it. He was furious, actually. He asked his boss what would make him play such a joke on him, and his reply was, My dear Mr. Barnum, it was all for our good. Remember, all we need to ensure success is notoriety. And they definitely achieved that because everyone in the town was talking about this joke and the circus was packed every night they spent in that town. Now if you remember last episode, you would know how Barnum ended up buying the American Museum in New York. But now he had to get people inside. A beggar approached him on the street and instead of giving him money, Barnum gave him a job. He took him back to the museum and gave him five bricks. Yes, the kind of bricks you make houses with. He told him to make a slow walk around several blocks, and at certain spots he was to lay down a brick on the sidewalk, but always keep one in the other hand. On his way back, he had to replace each brick on the street with the one he was holding. He was also ordered to keep a serious face and not answer any questions. Once he got back to the museum, he would enter, walk around inside a bit, then leave through the back door and repeat this all over again. After his first walk around, A couple hundred people watched him like he was crazy, but after his fourth time around, people started grouping around him and curious as to what the hell he was doing. Every time he walked in the museum, he was followed by dozens of people who bought tickets so they could keep watching him. A lot of them got distracted by the collections in the museum and stayed inside. After the first day, the man drew over a thousand people into the museum. After a few days, the police ordered him to cease and desist from the walks because the crowd started blocking traffic. He stopped, but the job was already done. Thousands of people entered the museum and became Barnum fans. A different tactic Barnum used was to put up a massive banner outside that said free music for the millions, with a band of musicians on the balcony overlooking the street. New Yorkers were thinking, what a generous guy and who doesn't like free? Many people would show up. Barnum though, he made sure that he hired the absolute worst musicians he could find And after the crowd heard how terrible they were, they would all run inside and buy tickets to the museum just to get away from the noise and booing of the crowd. My favorite had to be when he bought the carcass of what was said to be a mermaid. It was a creature that looked like a monkey with the body of a fish. The head and body were perfectly joined together. Barnum did some research and found out that the creature was put together in Japan, where the hoax was a huge deal. He decided to use this to his advantage. He planted articles in newspapers all around the country claiming that a mermaid was captured in the Fiji Islands. He sent the papers prints of paintings showing mermaids and by the time he showed the carcass in the museum, there was a huge national debate over whether they actually existed or not. A couple of months before Barnum's promotional campaign, nobody cared or even knew what a mermaid was. But now everyone was talking about them like they actually existed. Crowds would show up in record numbers to see the mermaid and hear debates about their existence. Barnum knew the value of attention and didn't care whether it was negative or positive. He just made sure he was talked about. The quality of the attention doesn't matter when you're starting off. Barnum never cared whether or not his shows got bad reviews or people slandering his name for his hoaxes. There was one newspaper critic that got really, really mad and ripped into him, and Barnum made sure to invite that man to an opening and gave him the best seat. Sometimes Barnum would write anonymous attacks on his own work just to keep his name floating around. He was a showman, and the main ingredient of his success was attention. I was considering making this video about Soldier Boy, but while he is a master of getting attention, I don't think there is as much intentional planning and crafting of the entire scheme and character that someone like P.T. Barnum had. 6 9 fits that example much better and someone I would definitely call a showman. After all, P.T. Barnum ran a circus and 6 9 looked like a clown. It's the perfect match. And many of the techniques 6 9 was using, even before he made music, were drawing attention from hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Before 6 9 got all the tattoos, rainbow hair, and joining a gang, there are two specific instances that I came across where he went viral. 
I thought nothing of them at the time, but when I found out it was 6ix9ine, I went back and was shocked. The first was the way he used to dress. There was a photo that was viral on Tumblr and Instagram of him wearing a black t-shirt and black shorts with the words pussy nigga printed massively across them. This draws attention and makes people think, who the hell would ever wear something like this? It's definitely not positive attention, but it gets shared. It's something you just feel the urge that you have to share with someone. Another was a vine where he did a wrestling move. I think it was a tombstone pile driver. I can't remember the exact move, so don't quote me on that. But it was on a girl, and this was huge too. A lot of people thought it was real, which is stupid, so that's one intriguing fact, but many people knew it was fake and just thought it was funny because for a guy to do a WWE move on a girl, it's not something you see every day online. It's incredibly rare, so when it does happen, it gets noticed. Then he came into the rap game. It's already been revealed that 6ix9ine was never really a gang member before 2017 and just joined that year. He had been caught dealing drugs and may have been affiliated, but he wasn't that kind of person. Young Thug already got enough shock and attention for being a faggot gangsta in hip hop and wearing dresses, so 6ix9ine had to one up that, and he did. He got 6ix9ine tattooed so many times all over his body, and at the time had some of the most outrageous face tats in the game. And add on to that rainbow hair. You had a walking circus. Then there was the content of his music that was very aggressive and rapping gangsta stuff. There was so much contrast to it. You've never seen a person with rainbow hair and face tattoos, and you definitely have never seen one that raps, and he got a lot of attention, mostly negative, just making fun of the way he looked. Then there came the revelation by Trippy Red of the thing with the underage girl, and he got the worst possible way to be smeared on planet Earth. His career hadn't even taken off. So how could he possibly recover from this? But he did. It gave him so much attention, albeit negative, but he channeled it and dropped Gummo, while also building a relationship with DJ Academics who allowed him to tell his story when no other media outlet would. And it was the perfect storm. 6 9 would never pump the brakes though. He planned a whole promotional campaign when he said LA was trash and recorded videos posting them on Instagram taunting the gang members there. And he had them out looking for him like where's Waldo when he had left days before. This wasn't necessarily negative attention, but it drew in a massive crowd of people who were on the edge of their seats and couldn't wait to see what would happen. Many of them wanting him to get jumped at the very least, but nothing happened. Think of it as a tightrope watch, somebody walking across a tightrope and some people are there that they don't want to see him fall, but some people are there because of the possibility that he might fall. It was basically the virtual version of that. This happened again when he called out Chicago, mainly Chief Keef he had beef with, flying out his baby mama but also saying he would pull up to Old Block and nothing would happen to him. 6 9 did pull up and recorded a video and posted it on social media. It went viral again. People were trying to find out the exact time and everything and they even pulled up security footage that showed he only got out of the car for 15 seconds at 3 in the morning. But he already got what he wanted. The attention from the situation and his music was good enough that this was all working great for him. He went from being an absolute nobody to the most hated and now had a massive amount of both fans and haters while also becoming the most talked about rapper on the internet in less than a year. One characteristic that allowed for 6 9 and Barnum to be able to do these stunts is knowing and acknowledging that getting attention was the end goal and they were willing to do whatever it took. 6 9 had no problem making himself look like an absolute fool and when he did that little singing skit with Tory Lanez, was it Tory Lanez? Or was it August Alsina? Or no, Trey Songs, Trey Songs. Most rappers are unable to make fun of themselves and take things too seriously, but 6 9 didn't care. Positive or negative, he loved the attention. He was much more likely to get paranoid or upset at waking up one day to no new followers or notifications than getting thousands of hate messages. With almost every chapter, there is a reversal, and this one is arguably the most important thus far, and it reads, In the beginning of your rise to the top, you must attract attention at all costs, but as you rise higher, you must constantly adapt. Never wear the public out with the same tactic. There are times when the need for attention must be deferred, and when scandal and notoriety are the last things you want to create. The attention you attract must never offend or challenge the reputation of those above you. There is an art to knowing when to draw notice and when to withdraw. Never appear overly greedy for attention, then, for it signals insecurity, and insecurity drives power away. 
Understand that there are times when it is not in your interest to be the center of attention. When in the presence of a king or queen, for instance, or the equivalent thereof, bow and retreat to the shadows, never compete. Certain tactics that seem desperate for attention is when Lil Pump, for instance, recorded himself giving a homeless man money. It was seen as a desperate attempt for attention, and people neither gave it positive or negative attention. It was largely ignored. But it's really important to talk about the last law in relation to this one, which was protect your reputation at all costs. It sounds contradictory to protect your reputation and get attention at all costs, but it depends on what your objective is. For instance, if you're an artist that's really into that retarded feminist ideology and being an absolute simp loser, if it ever comes out that you pimp slap some hoe, you'll get massive attention, but it will likely ruin your reputation, if not your career. However, if someone, and we'll use a legitimate example being Famous Dex, beats the brakes out of his girl, or NBA Youngboy, nobody cares. They get up a bunch of attention from the incident, but they aren't really hurt by it because their reputation isn't one of them being the most upstanding person. Some could say they would even be expected of this kind of behavior. Barnum, 6 9 and even Soldier Boy aren't hurt by all their attention-grabbing stunts because their reputation is that of someone who entertains. And as long as they continue doing that, people will ignore outright lies or even scams because of the level of entertainment they get from them. However, there's also a massive downfall to this, and that is if you ever want to be taken seriously and trusted, it's not going to happen. It's important to weigh the pros and cons and see what kind of results you want to have, and if it's worth it on a person-to-person -person basis. For these guys, it was clearly worth it, despite two of them currently being locked up. Law 7 is get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. Use the wisdom, knowledge, and legwork of other people to further your own cause. Not only will such assistance save you valuable time and energy, it will give you a godlike aura of efficiency and speed. In the end, your helpers will be forgotten and you will be remembered. Never do yourself what others can do for you. The story we're going to go over is Nikola Tesla, who was a Serbian scientist working for the European division of Con Edison. He was a genius inventor, to say the least, and a plant manager and friend of Thomas Edison convinced him that he should seek opportunity in America, even giving him a letter of introduction to Edison. This all sounds great until what happens next. When Tesla met with Edison, he was hired immediately and began working 18-hour days, finding ways to improve the Edison dynamos which were the power generators they had back then. Tesla offered to redesign them from the ground up and Edison thought this could take years without paying off, and didn't even think it was possible, but he told Tesla, there's $50,000 in it for you, if you can do it. Keep in mind, this is still the 1800s. It was a lot of money at the time. Tesla began working tirelessly, day in and day out, and after only a year, he had created a way better version of the Dynamo with automatic controls. He went to Edison to inform him of the good news and collect his 50 racks. Edison was happy with the improvement, him and his company were going to take credit for it, but when it came to payment, he told him, Tesla, you don't understand our American humor, and gave him a tiny raise instead. Another separate incident. Tesla wanted to create an alternating current system, abbreviated AC, of electricity. At the time, Edison believed in direct currents, DC, and refused to support Tesla's research, but would do everything in his power to sabotage him as well. Tesla went to a rival of Edison's by the name of George Westinghouse, who started his own electric company. Westinghouse agreed to fund Tesla and offered him a generous royalty agreement on all future profits. The AC system Tesla developed is still the standard today, but after patents were filed in his name, a bunch of other scientists came forward trying to take credit for his invention and claiming they were the ones who paved the way for him. His name was lost and eventually the invention became associated with Westinghouse in the public's eye but at least Tesla was getting paid, right? Not quite and not for long. JP Morgan was taking over Westinghouse and they made him rescind the royalty contract he signed with Tesla, and it means take it back. Westinghouse told Tesla that his company wouldn't survive if it had to pay him the full royalties and convinced Tesla to accept a buyout of his patents for $216,000, which sounds like a lot, and it was at that time, but the patents were actually worth $12 million at the time, so he got ripped off. These people took away his riches, his patents, and the credit for the greatest invention of his entire career. 
There's also the radio. A man named Guglielmo Marconi is linked with the invention of it, but in the process of the invention, he broadcasted a signal across the English Channel in 1899 that used a patent Tesla had filed two years prior, and most of his work depended on Tesla's research. Tesla again got no money and no credit, and would live poor as an old man while people got rich on his work. In 1917, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers notified Tesla that he was going to receive the Edison Medal, and he turned it down. He replied, You propose to honor me a medal which I could pin upon my coat and strut for a vain hour before the members of your institute. You would decorate my body and continue to let starve for failure to supply recognition, my mind and its creative products, which have supplied the foundation upon which the major portion of your institute exists. It wasn't until Elon Musk that Tesla's name really became known to the public because they never mentioned him in school. And if they did, it was very briefly, but they put a strong emphasis on Thomas Edison. And if I had to guess, it's maybe because Tesla was Serbian and Edison is American. Of course, they don't want to make an American look bad in the American school system. So they paint him as this great inventor when he was more of a businessman that was a great businessman, but did some scummy things. Promising a man money and not paying up is breaking your word. And if you're a man, there's absolutely no excuse whatsoever for that to ever happen. One of Edison's quotes was, Everybody steals in commerce and industry. I've stolen a lot myself, but I know how to steal. And he definitely knew how to do that. Tesla was just a purebred scientist. He didn't think science should have anything to do with politics and claimed he didn't care about fame and riches. Kind of sounds like some artists that get taken advantage of. But this mentality is partially what ruined him. Since he didn't have fame or credit, he was unable to attract investors to his ideas. He wanted to do everything on his own, but it was impossible. Edison, on the other hand, wasn't really a scientist or an inventor. He was a businessman and public figure. He would see trends and opportunities, then hire the best people to do the work for him and take credit for it. This is exactly the same thing as the music industry. Except to be fair, people are usually compensated well for their efforts instead of just staying broke. Rihanna, for example, writes no music, produces no music, doesn't do any of the design work on her albums, doesn't oversee the executive production. She pretty much does nothing except for the vocals. And she isn't an outstanding singer either, but she's still pretty good. I enjoy some of her stuff. They mostly tell her exactly what to do and say. In the beginning of her career, Jay-Z had written a lot of or most of her songs. And there's going to be idiots thinking I hate Rihanna. No, I don't really care. I've always liked their music since 2006, actually. But the truth is the truth. Rihanna isn't some insane performer either, like Beyonce, whose choreography and routines take a lot of work and effort. But Rihanna gets the credit for everything. The reason Rihanna is able to do things like Fenty Beauty and her clothing line and everything else she does outside of music is because of all the work that these producers, writers, and artists put into her music. She's really just a brand, and her job is to just make appearances and go on tour. Some people might cite Michael Jackson as well, but Jackson had writing credits on other people's songs, so while he may have not written all of his music, he was most definitely still a writer, and he's arguably the greatest performer of all time. This doesn't mean that Rihanna is a bad person or behaving unethically. Most of the people that are writers or producers don't care for the limelight. They're perfectly fine with just getting paid well so they can do what they love every day, and it would likely frustrate them to have to be a public figure that's under all this scrutiny, having to make appearances, and can't go anywhere without being mopped by people. The issue comes is when one of these people doesn't really accept their role and start to get envious of all the fame and credit that Rihanna or whoever they're helping make famous is getting. This happened with Quentin Miller, and also briefly with Party Next Door. Party Next Door helped Rihanna get a number one hit, will work, but has never even been close to one himself. Over the years, he's towed the line between being comfortable as a more low-key artist and getting the bag and wanting to be that superstar. Also, he's helped Drake a lot. There's a reason there are very rarely, if ever, any ugly female music artists that are superstars. It doesn't even matter if they're talented because a lot goes into being a superstar that isn't just talent. You need to have a certain charisma about you, a certain unique look, Sometimes just being conventionally pretty isn't enough, and more. A lot of producers or writers are very shy. The Weeknd is an example of a rare case of someone who has no personality, doesn't really speak, yet is still able to become a superstar because of how insanely talented he is, but also his looks. 
Do you think he'd be that high at the top if he wasn't good looking? Maybe if he was a rapper. But as a singer, you kind of had to be good looking. Do you think Jay-Z would have ever made it as a singer, even if he could sing? Most likely not. But at the end of the day, in 10 years time, even today, your average fan, 99% of them don't even know who wrote work or produced it or any of Rihanna's tracks. Her name is on all of them and they attribute all of the credit to her. None of these guys or girls will be remembered, but Rihanna will. And that's the trade-off that they're willing to make. Similarly for Kanye West and people like Rhymefest or any of the other writers that helped him with his classic albums. The reversal for this law is as follows. There are times when taking the credit for work that others have done is not the wise course. If your power is not firmly enough established, you will seem to be pushing people out of the limelight. To be a brilliant exploiter of talent, your position must be unshakable, or you will be accused of deception. This is why small artists can't steal from big artists without getting a ton of blowback and hate. But when a small artist even shows proof that a bigger artist stole from them, the majority will try and make every excuse to deny it unless it's absolutely blatant copying, which it almost never is. Most of the time, a bigger artist needs to just ignore the situation if it's picking up steam for about a week, and everyone will forget about it. And as it connects with one of the earlier laws of protecting your reputation, stealing before anyone even knows you will have you labeled as that for the duration of your career and make it difficult for anybody to want to work with you. And today we're going to talk about how Pusha T won the beef versus Drake. Law 8 is make other people come to you. Use bait if necessary. When you force the other person to act, you are the one in control. It is always better to make your opponent come to you, abandoning his own plans in the process. Lure him with fabulous gains, then attack. You hold the cards. The story from the chapter we're going to look over is of Napoleon Bonaparte. At the Congress of Vienna in 1814, all the big nations of Europe came together to distribute what was left of Napoleon's fallen empire. Napoleon wasn't far away. He wasn't executed but sent to the island of Elba just off the coast of Italy. Even though he was captured on an island, everyone was still nervous. They knew what Napoleon was capable of and the Austrians wanted to kill him at Elba but decided against it because of the risk. Alexander I, Russian Tsar, had an outburst during the Congress when he was denied a part of Poland and he's quoted as saying, Beware, I shall loose the monster. And by monster, he meant Napoleon. Of all the statesmen, the only person who wasn't nervous or anxious at Vienna was Talleyrand, Napoleon's former foreign minister. He was just chilling in the cut like he knew something that they didn't. That winter, something strange happened. British ships were surrounding the island of Elba and cannons pointed at every possible escape route. But in the middle of the day, on February 26, 1815, a ship with 900 men picked up Napoleon and took off. The English chased but weren't able to catch up and this news frightened everyone in Europe and the statesmen at the Congress of Vienna. Napoleon could have safely left Europe, but he didn't. He went back to France and marched to Paris with his own small army to try and recapture his throne. And he did. People were throwing themselves at him. One marshal had sent his army to arrest him, but once they saw their former leader, they switched sides. Crowds were going wild in Paris, and the king who replaced Napoleon left the country. Napoleon was back on the throne and ruled France for the next hundred days. But things got worse, quickly. France was bankrupt, its resources had depleted, and there was nothing he could do about it. At the Battle of Waterloo, he was defeated once and for all, and this time they exiled him to the faraway island of St. Helena, off the coast of Africa. He had no chance of escaping now. The question here is, how did he escape? Or, who let him escape? It wasn't until years later that the facts would come out. Visitors came to Napoleon and told him that he was more popular in France than ever, and the country was ready to follow him again. This was while he was on the island of Elba. One of the visitors was Austrian General Kohler, who convinced Napoleon that if he escaped the European powers, including England, they would welcome him back. And they weren't lying. The English just let him go right by them in the middle of the day. But there was a man behind all of this, and that was his former minister Talleyrand, who was at the Congress just chilling with no worries. And he put this plan together, not out of loyalty for Napoleon, but to finally crush him. He was against Napoleon's ambitions of conquering more land and ruining the stability for Europe, and when he was initially captured, he wanted Napoleon sent further away, but nobody listened to him. He baited Napoleon. He knew he wouldn't change, and would lead the country into a war again, and since France was so weak, it would only last a couple of months. 
One of the diplomats who knew what happened even said, he has set the house ablaze in order to save it from the plague. You might be asking, how in the hell does this connect to the Pusha T and Drake beef that happened over a year ago? There's two versions of events that we can look at with that beef since none of us really know what happened. There's one side that Pusha T gave us, which is that Drake's best friend, OVO40, or Noah Shabib, was pillow talking to some thought, the secret of him having an illegitimate son, and hiding him, or that Kanye West told Pusha T after Drake had told Kanye West. For this video, we're going to go with the second one. I can't say if I believe one or the other, but the first one seems way too convenient for Pusha T, and the second one seems way too convenient for Drake, but the first one has yet to be proven. This is a case where we can draw parallels between Talleyrand as Kanye West and Drake as Napoleon. It doesn't line up exactly, but the concepts do. And the first is the bait that Pusha T sent out. Pusha T is not the hottest rapper. Hardly. And in order to promote his album, he released the track Infrared, taking shots at Drake, with no more than the simple stuff we already know about him having had writers. Big deal. Meek Mill had already revealed this, and Drake only got bigger and won that beef. This would be easy for Drake to walk over. In the same way when Napoleon knew he was going to be let out, this was way too easy to take over France once again. Drake could have just ignored this track, and people would have forgotten about it within the week. But he was thirsty for blood. He had been catching nothing but non-stop W's and felt it was finally time to crush Pusha T, so he drops Duppy Freestyle. This track was hard, and people thought Drake was winning the beef at this point, putting salt on the wound when he made an Instagram post of an invoice of services rendered for reviving a career and promotion. Even rapping on the song Duppy Freestyle, yeah, who gassed you to play with me? Man, you made the shit as easy as ABCs, whoever supposedly making me hits, but then got no hits, sound like they need me. My hooks did it. My lyrics did it. My spirits did it. I'm fearless with it. Yeah, I really should have given you none of my time because you're older than the nigga you running behind. Look, holla at me when you're multi-million. I told you keep playing with my name and I'ma let it ring on you like Virginia Williams. I'm too resilient. Get out your feelings. It's gonna be a cruel summer for you. I told Wheezy and Baby I'ma done them for you. Tell Ye we got an invoice coming to you considering that we just sold another 20 for you. Drake thought this was a piece of cake. And it would have been if this was all the ammo Pusha T had. Just like it would have been a wrap if France was as strong as before when Napoleon took back the throne. But I believe that before Pusha T even started out, by dropping infrared, he already had the trump card planned thanks to Kanye West. Keep in mind, Good Music was releasing their albums all throughout the month of June. And with all of this attention plus the ruining of Drake's reputation that they hoped for, it would push Kanye and Good, or Talleyrand and France, to the top. Kanye West has been lagging behind Drake musically for some years now, commercially speaking. Drake has been selling way more and had been helping Kanye as he raps in the first verse. So if you rebuke me for working with someone else on a couple of Vs, what do you really think of the nigga that's making your beats? I've done things for him I thought that he would never need. Father had to stretch his hands out and get it from me. Once Drake responded, Pusha T and his camp must have been excited, jumping for joy. He had fell for the bait, hook, line, and sinker. While everyone on social media thought Drake washed Pusha T, they were ready to go nuclear. Beefs aren't won by just diss tracks anymore or who can rap better. It's way more about public perception and the person's image. So when Pusha T not only drops a diss track, but accompanies it with a hilarious picture of Drake with black on his face, and mentioning that he's hiding a baby from the world with the lines, since you name dropped my fiance, let him know who you chose as your Beyonce. Sophie knows better as your baby mother cleaned up for her IG, but the stench is on her. A baby's involved is deeper than rap. We talk in character. Let me keep with the facts. You were hiding a child. Let that boy come home. Deadbeat, mother effer playing border patrol. Oh, Adonis is your son and he deserves more than an Adidas press run. That's real. Love that baby. Respect that girl. Forget she's a porn star. Let her be your world. Ugh. That's just the nail in the coffin. Having a baby with a worthless thought and then hiding it. And the context didn't even matter for the cover image because people's initial emotions when they saw it weren't going to change. Most of them didn't even bother to look for the context. Drake didn't reply after this. And he's vaguely given excuses about it being bigger than music. And he didn't want to go as far. Him having another track, but it was over, bro. There was no type of ammo he could have came back with that was as devastating as what Pusha T put out on Story of Adi Don. Unlike Napoleon, Drake wasn't finished for good and has been having plenty of success, but this was a massive L. 
he had to just lay low and lick his wounds until people forgot about it and the majority don't even care about this anymore. If Pusha T ever releases another album, it's likely it won't sell as much as Daytona. Even though Daytona was one of the best albums released in 2018, Pusha T also doesn't release albums for years. The music on Daytona can last a long time, even if it's only 7 tracks. As calculated as Drake is, his ego allowed him to fall for the bait or the low-hanging fruit here. Good music, Kanye West possibly, and Pusha T milked them for so much promotion and made him look like a clown. Nobody is perfect all of the time, but he had to have learned his lesson. And let's not forget how Kanye West flipped this. Drake began attacking him on tracks in Scorpion like Mob Ties and his feature on Sicko Mode with Travis Scott and Kanye turned himself into a victim and making Drake look like the big bad bully who couldn't respond to Pusha T but threatening a family man like Kanye West. The reversal to this law is as follows. Although it is generally the wiser policy to make others exhaust themselves chasing you, there are opposite cases where striking suddenly and aggressively at the enemy so demoralizes him that his energies sink. Instead of making others come to you, you go to them. Force the issue, take the lead. Fast attack can be an awesome weapon, for it forces the other person to react without the time to think or plan. With no time to think, people make errors of judgment and are thrown on the defensive. This tactic is the obverse of waiting and baiting, but it serves the same function, you make your enemy respond on your own terms. One time where this reversal could have worked wonders is in the case of Meek Mill vs Drake. If, instead of just dropping a bunch of tweets revealing the most important information we've ever learned about Drake, and yes, him not writing his own songs is more important than him having a kid. I don't give a damn if he had one kid or 50 kids he was hiding. That doesn't affect legacy. But not writing your own music? That does. If Meek Mill had just turned those tweets into part of a verse and a punchline or revelation in the track was that Drake had a ghostwriter, it would have been a rap. Drake would have been scrambling because the pressure would have been on at that point, and when you're on the clock, and you're hit with an attack you never expected, mistakes are going to be made. Today we're going to talk about how Russ took over hip-hop and made the Forbes list using the 48 Laws of Power. Law 9 is, win through your actions, never through argument. Any momentary triumph you have gained through argument is really a pyrrhic victory. The resentment and ill will you stir up is stronger and lasts longer than any momentary change of opinion. It is much more powerful to get others to agree with you through your actions without saying a word. Demonstrate, do not explicate. This is the first episode we're going to go through two different stories to relate to the artists we're talking about because Russ was on both sides of this law, and we'll mention how later on, so sit tight. The first story is one of a Roman engineer. In 131 BC, the Roman consul Publius was sieging the Greek town of Pergamus and needed a battering ram to force through the walls and get in the town. A few days earlier, he saw some huge ship masts in a shipyard in Athens and ordered for the largest to be sent to him right away. The military engineer who got the request was sure that the consul wanted the smaller mast. He kept arguing with the soldiers who sent the order and kept trying to convince them that it was way better for breaching and it would be easier to transport. The soldiers were just following orders and informed the engineer that their leader wasn't someone you argued with, but he knew that they were wrong. The engineer even drew multiple diagrams and told them that he's the expert, tried to explain it to them, but the soldiers knew it was a wrap for them if they disobeyed the order, so they convinced the engineer to just obey the orders. Once they left, it was still on his mind, just nagging at him. Why would he obey an order that he knew was going to fail? So he ended up sending the smaller mast, and once the leader saw how effective it was, he would reward him for his help, right? Boy was he wrong. When the smaller mast arrived, Publius questioned his soldiers and asked for an explanation. They told him the engineer kept arguing about a smaller mast, but in the end agreed to send the larger one, and Publius was enraged. He was unable to concentrate on sieging or remember how important it was to breach before the town got reinforcements. The only thing on his mind was the engineer who he wanted to come before him immediately. A couple of days later, the engineer still thought he would be rewarded, and explained to Publius one more time why a smaller mast was better and why he had sent it. He gave the same arguments, and said it is in his best interest to listen to experts, and if he would use the battering ram in an attack, he wouldn't regret it. Publius let him finish, and then he had him flogged and scourged with rods in front of his soldiers until he died. This is also a great story because it can relate back to Law 1, which is never outshine the master. 
If Publius was leading an army, and he was wrong about the size of the mass they needed, it would make him look like a fool, and all the praise would go to the engineer. I can also relate because I used to be like the engineer. I just wouldn't understand how people couldn't see the logic and answer that I laid out right in front of their eyes until I realized that arguing is pointless. There's an excerpt in the chapter saying, The military engineer was the quintessence of the arguer, a type found everywhere among us. The arguer does not understand that words are never neutral, and that by arguing with the superior, he impugns the intelligence of one more powerful than he. He also has no awareness of the person he's dealing with. Since each man believes that he is right, and words will rarely convince him otherwise, the arguer's reasoning falls on deaf ears. When cornered, he only argues more, digging his own grave. Once he has made the other person feel insecure and inferior in his beliefs, the eloquence of Socrates could not save the situation. This is the situation Russ found himself in when he first started getting attention in hip-hop, around the end of 2016, first through several Vlad interviews, but then during a promo run for his album There's Really a Wolf that was set to release in 2017. Nobody knew who he was, but he had the demeanor of the engineer, and he was right, just like the engineer was. He had a strong fan base and was making a lot more money than many of these rappers that get more attention. He even tried to, logically, explain to people that these rappers they thought were so big need to tour with several other rappers just to tour venues and sell out tickets that he was doing on his own. But nobody wanted to hear any of that. It was falling on deaf ears. The people just labeled him a hater and started a hate campaign that he cleverly capitalized on. Some of you might be thinking like I was when I first read this. If we can't argue our points, then how the hell do we get it across to the other party? And this next story explains how Michelangelo did it, and how Russ took almost the same tactic. In 1502, at the works department of the Church of Santa Maria del Fior, in Florence, Italy, there was a huge block of marble just sitting there. It was at one time a great piece of work, but a bad sculptor made a mistake and bore a hole through it where the legs were supposed to be. Florence's mayor... Piero Sordorini, wanted to try and save the block by hiring Leonardo da Vinci or some other master sculptor, but gave up, since almost all of them said it was ruined and could not be repaired. It just sat there, a bunch of wasted money, gathering dust, until some friends of Michelangelo wrote to him. He was living in Rome at the time, and they said that by himself, he should be able to make something out of it. Michelangelo came to Florence, looked over the stone, and told him he could carve a beautiful figure. Some weeks later, when he was finishing the final touches, Sardarini, the mayor, showed up to the studio. He was feeling himself, and was analyzing the work from top to bottom, and told Michelangelo he thought it was amazing, but the nose was a little too big. Michelangelo saw that the mayor was standing in a place underneath the figure, so his perspective was distorted. He didn't say a word, but signaled for the mayor to follow him up the scaffolding. He reached to the nose and picked up his chisel, as well as some marble dust that was laying around. The mayor was a couple of feet below him. Michelangelo started to lightly tap his chisel against the nose, but not enough that it would make any change. And with each tap, he would drop some dust he had in his hand. He didn't alter the nose at all, but it looked as if he was working on it. A couple of minutes later, he asked the mayor to check it out now, and the mayor said, I like it better. You've made it come alive. What Michelangelo did here was incredibly smart. He knew that if he changed the nose, it might ruin the entire sculpture. But the mayor was a patron and considered himself an excellent judge of aesthetics. So for Michelangelo to have tried to argue with him, it would put his future projects in danger and funding. And he knew it was an issue for perspective. So he gestured without saying anything for him to move to the right place. But also had the mayor believe Michelangelo changed the nose when he really didn't. He kept the statue as is and feeding the mayor's ego. Two birds, one stone. How did Russ transition from being the engineer into this second type of approach? First, he stopped doing interviews and really limited his social media presence or even really speaking on other rappers or artists for a long time until, as, until recently, I should say. An excerpt says, Everyone knows that in the heat of an argument, we will all say anything to support our cause. We will quote the Bible, refer to unverifiable statistics. Who can be persuaded by bags of air like that? Action and demonstration are much more powerful and meaningful. They are there, before our eyes, for us to see. There are no offensive words, no possibility of misinterpretation. No one can argue with a demonstrated proof. 
This is what happened when it came to Russ versus Smoke Perp or even Adam22, two individuals that continuously kept coming at him sideways. Russ didn't address them head on, but behind the scenes and when everyone was asking Smoke Perp what happened to his eye, he came out and said that Russ got him jumped and Adam22 came out after and said he was visited by Russ goons as well. And when Smoke Perp tried to wiggle out of it and not admit what really happened, that's when Russ decided to release the footage. That black eye was a symbol. There were no words. You can't argue with that. It changed people's perspective of him as some sort of pretty boy making love songs for the females. Another excerpt that applies. The most powerful persuasion goes beyond action into symbol. The power of a symbol, a flag, a mythic story, a monument to some emotional event is that everyone understands you without anything being said. In Russ's case, he continuously kept posting pictures on Instagram whenever he received a RIAA certified plaque, whether it was gold or platinum. And after seeing one after the other after the other, you just realized he's actually successful. Especially when you put it against other rappers who get way more attention, but you can't remember the last time they posted a plaque, if they ever received one. And the biggest had to be when he made the Forbes list in 2018 for Hip Hop's Cash Kings. That spoke everything that he had been saying for two years without him having to utter a word. You could see him tied with Swiss Beats and alongside the likes of Chance the Rapper, Travis Scott, Birdman, Lil Uzi Vert, Lil Wayne, Logic, and Meek Mill. He was the only newcomer on there. The rest of these guys have been established for years. He took the opportunity to flex a bit on Instagram with the caption, I ain't make the Dean's list, but I bet I make the Forbes list. 2015 lyrics manifested. Thank you to the fans. Made the Cash Kings list. Tag a rapper who shows cash and jewelry all the time, but didn't make the list. This had the fans reevaluating. Because at the end of the day, what hip-hop fans have always valued is money. And that just proved everything he was saying in 2016 was true. There was no Young Thug on there. No Lil Pump or any number of other rappers that appear to be really popular and you would assume they were making a lot of money since they're flexing all the time, but that isn't the case. The reversal to this law is as follows. Verbal argument has one vital use in the realm of power, to distract and cover your tracks when you are practicing deception or are caught in a lie. In such cases, it is to your advantage to argue with all the conviction you can muster, draw the other person into an argument to distract them from your deceptive move. When caught in a lie, the more emotional and certain you appear, the less likely it seems that you are lying. I can't even count the amount of times this has been used by rappers and artists. Soldier Boy gotta have used this so many times, one being when he said he bought a $6 million penthouse, but in reality he was just renting it off Airbnb. The tactic that most people use in this case is to call you or anyone a hater that is criticizing them for their lies and deception. Why do they do this? Well, because barely anyone wants to appear as a hater, and it draws them into a different argument entirely. They're no longer talking about what that artist has done that was bad or deceitful or a lie, but they're trying to defend themselves and justify why they aren't haters. It just shifts the entire conversation. Law 10 is infection. Avoid the unhappy and unlucky. You can die from someone else's misery. Emotional states are as infectious as diseases. You may feel you are helping the drowning man, but you are only precipitating your own disaster. The unfortunate sometimes draw misfortune on themselves. They will also draw it on you. Associate with the happy and fortunate instead. The story we're going over takes place in 19th century Europe, and the woman's name is Marie Gilbert. She was born in Ireland but went to Paris in the 1840s to make a career as a dancer and performer. She took the name Lola Montez and was claiming she was a flamenco dancer from Spain. Her career wasn't going too hot, and five years later, in order to put food on the table, she became a courtesan and one of the most successful ones in Paris. A courtesan is basically a prostitute, or an escort, or a whore. One that works with mainly wealthy dudes, though. There was one guy that could save her dancing career, and that was the owner of the newspaper that had the largest circulation in France, Alexander Dujarrier, and the drama critic of that same paper. She decided to do some research on him, or stalking, as we should call it, and she found out that he went riding every morning. She was a good horse rider, <laughs> definitely a lot better than her dancing. So she was riding one morning and just happened to run into him, or so he thought. She quickly seduced him and within a few weeks she moved into his apartment. 
They were happy together for a little while, and with his help, her dead career was beginning to get some life. And even though he was a high-class individual, he told his friends that he was going to marry her in the spring. But his life was going to take a turn for the worst because of this love. He was invited to a party that was going to be attended by some of the richest young men in Paris. Lola wanted to go with him, but he refused to let her. They had a fight, and Dujarrier ended up going alone and got really drunk. He insulted a very important drama critic by the name of Jean-Baptiste Rosemont du Beauvalon, likely due to his criticism of Lola's dancing. Jean-Baptiste challenged Dujarrier to a duel the next morning, and unfortunately for Dujarrier, he was one of the best shooters in all of France. He tried to apologize to Jean-Baptiste, but he wasn't having it, and during the duel, Dujarrier got shot and killed. Lola decided to leave Paris. It wasn't long before she was on to her next man. She was in Munich and was after King Ludwig of Bavaria. So like most IG thoughts, she knew she had to get through the tour manager before she could get to the rapper. She went for his aide, Count Otto von Reckberg, who had a soft spot for pretty girls. He was having breakfast one day at a cafe when Lola rode by on her horse and accidentally got thrown off, landing at his feet. The Count rushed to the rescue and was enamored by her beauty. He promised he would introduce her to Ludwig. He arranged an audience for her with the king, but she could overhear the king saying he was too busy to hear someone he had never heard of, who clearly wanted something from him. Lola pushed aside the guards and walked into his room, and somehow her dress accidentally got ripped and her bare chest was revealed. You don't have to be a genius to guess that he would like to listen to what she had to say after that. Less than two days later, she made her debut as a dancer on the Bavarian stage with terrible reviews, as per usual, but that wouldn't stop the king from having her booked for more shows. Ludwig himself said that he was bewitched by her. He began walking with her by his side in public. Think about it, a king with a prostitute. He bought an apartment for her in one of the most expensive places in Munich. He started buying her tons of gifts and writing poems for her, even though this was totally out of character for him. And with all this attention in the public, she would become rich and famous overnight. She definitely didn't know how to handle this though. In one incident, there was an old man in front of her riding his horse too slow, and she pulled out the whip you use for a horse and started hitting him with it. There was a different incident when she took her dog out for a walk off of his leash and he attacked the person. This got the citizens of Bavaria very angry, but Ludwig went against his own people and sided with Lola, even granting her citizenship. Maybe you don't want to listen to the common folk, but even his close advisors were warning him to stay away from Lola, but he fired anyone who criticized her. He didn't stop there. He made her countess and built a new palace for her and let her advise him on policy, becoming the most powerful individual in Bavaria since she had him wrapped around her finger. She was promoting liberalism and all these policies that the Jesuits and conservatives of Bavaria, which was almost the entire population, found despicable. Ludwig easily had to be top 10 simps of all time. But riots began breaking out and threats of a looming civil war were brewing. Ludwig couldn't stand the pressure anymore and asked her to leave. But the people couldn't just go back to business as usual after what they witnessed from their supposed king. They forced him to leave his post. Lola was on to the next, this time home of the worst rap music in the world, England. This time her prey was a young army officer named George Trafford Held, who was the son of an influential barrister, which was a high-level lawyer of sorts. He was 10 years younger than her, and had his pick of the litter when it came to young and beautiful females. He could have had anyone he wanted, but this grandma ended up casting a spell on him. They were married in less than a year but she had been arrested on the charge of bigamy, which is getting married twice. Because before all of this started, even before she had gone to Paris originally, she was still legally married to someone she had eloped with years ago. She skipped bail, and they went to Spain. But during a bad argument, Lola slashed George with a knife, and he decided it was time to dip. When he came back to England, everything was gone for him. He lost his post in the army, and English society wanted nothing to do with his tainted name. He moved to Portugal and lived poor for only a few months before he died of drowning in a boating accident. Some years later, 
the man who published Lola's autobiography, didn't die, but he went bankrupt. In 1853, she decided to head to America, California to be exact, where this granny was able to get herself a man by the name of Padhole, who she married. Eventually, she got fed up with him and left him for someone else. Pat became an alcoholic and depressed until he died four years later, still at a young age. But there was another individual who was a co-respondent in a divorce lawsuit against her who was killed shortly afterwards. When Lola turned 41, she decided to give all her clothes and fancy items away and turn to God, going and speaking across America on different religious topics dressed like she wasn't a prostitute who had left a trail of destruction wherever she went. She died two years later from tertiary effects of syphilis in Brooklyn, New York, and I think that's what we call irony. How could this possibly connect to Lil Durk is what you might be asking yourself, and it's a valid question. There was a video on YouTube a long time ago called The Lil Durk Curse, and it was made by Hip Wiki, so credit to him. But to sum it up, Anyone who was close to Lil Durk ended up with the same fortune as anyone who was close to Lola Montez, and that was usually death. Let's go over all the incidents one by one today. In the What's Up music video, where Lil Durk is featured alongside Fredo Santana and Lil Reese, there are three people right next to Durk in the scene in an alleyway. The names are J Money, Newski, also known as OTF Nunu, and Pluto. J Money was killed only a couple of months later at the age of 21. OTF Nunu, who was really on the rise and made a couple of great songs, was killed less than a year later. And Pluto died in a car crash at the age of 24, the same year that video was shot and uploaded. In a scene from the song Guns and Money by Lil Durk featuring King Skrilla, both D Rose and THF Bobo or Bobo are in the video. D Rose got sentenced to 40 years in prison for a murder of a 14 year old. And Bobo was shot to death at age 23 as he was walking out of prison for beating a murder case on a technicality. Talk about bad luck. Or karma. In the music video for This Ain't What You Want, Beizu got arrested for murder in 2014 that was committed on July 4th of 2009, five years ago, on the Chirac All-Star Game, of course. In the music video for a Big Ol' Nigga or B-O-N, you can see OTF Chino, who was Lil Durk's manager, talking on the phone, and he ended up getting shot and killed, sitting in his car. In a different video, you can see someone with a red bulls cap by the name of Five Star. He didn't die, but he did get 20 years for selling laced heroin in Iowa, of all places. In another music video, with Lil Reese and Fredo Santana titled Beef, you can see Fredo Santana as well as see him in many other music videos, and he died from a seizure in 2018. This is one of the individuals we could just say or chalk it up. He didn't suffer a terrible fate because he could have died from getting shot or ended up in prison for decades. And he lived a long time after the whole Chirac drill scene took off. In the video for Hose and Bottles by Lil Durk, you can see King Louie, who got shot in the head in 2015, about two years after the video. But he survived and is still alive right now. Maxwell Gadow, who was a 17-year-old fan of Lil Durk, just took a picture with him, and only moments later, he was shot in the back and killed while in his car with a girl who also got shot, but I'm pretty sure she survived. In the video for Play For Keeps, you can see Rondo No. 9 and L.A. Capone. L.A. Capone would get shot and killed in 2013 after leaving a studio session, and Rondo No. 9 would get 39 years in prison for murder. There's a music video for the song Gon' Lie by Chinks that Lil Durk was featured in, and only six months later, Chinks was shot and killed in his own neighborhood. The most recent victim was Lil Durk himself. He turned himself in on May 30th in Georgia for charges of criminal attempt to commit murder, aggravated assault, shooting at, unlawful for person employed by associated with criminal street gang to conduct or participate in criminal gang activity, possession of a firearm, during commission of a felony and possession of firearm by convicted felon, and he was released on $250,000 bond. They're saying that they have camera footage of him and this other dude, I think his name is Vaughn, doing the crime. But I hope that isn't so for Lil Dirk. This is creepy, and it might seem like it's messed up to avoid certain people that bring bad luck with them, but it's the truth. 
There are certain people in this world that always have something bad happening to them or anyone around them. It might seem like it's not even their fault, but they're a cloud of darkness and there is no point in trying to save or rescue them. The best option is to stay as far away as possible. Like I said, sometimes it's seemingly out of their control, like in the case of Lil Durk, but others do it to themselves. Certain individuals that are pessimistic always have a negative view towards the world, and it's why nothing good happens to them, because they're never grateful for all the good that they have in life. The reversal to this law is as follows. This law admits of no reversal. Its application is universal. There is nothing to be gained by associating with those who infect you with their misery. There is only power and good fortune to be obtained by associating with the fortunate. Ignore this law at your peril. Today we're going to talk about how Kanye West and Kim Kardashian were able to hit up Donald Trump to save ASAP Rocky. Now law 11 is learn to keep people dependent on you. To maintain your independence you must always be needed and wanted. The more you are relied on, the more freedom you have. Make people depend on you for their happiness and prosperity and you have nothing to fear. Never teach them enough so that they can do without you. Otto von Bismarck had become a deputy in the Prussian parliament at age 32 and he had no friends around him. Usually, those in parliament would choose to ally themselves with the liberals or conservatives that were also in parliament, but he decided against that. He didn't decide to aim for a certain minister or even the people of Prussia because they could all turn against him. He went for the tippy top, the king, Frederick William IV. Bismarck despised the king's leadership, or lack of leadership. He was a weak man who couldn't make decisions. It was like they had a female running things. He was always giving in to the liberals in parliament, and the little that he did stand for was against everything Bismarck believed in, both policy and how he conducted himself as a man. But still, he would slowly demonstrate his allegiance to Frederick. When others would attack him, Bismarck was the only one that would defend him. Four years later, in 1851, Bismarck was made a minister in the king's cabinet. All that preparation had paid off, but his work had just begun. He had actual influence on the king now, and wanted him to build up the military and stand against the liberals. He encouraged the king to be more of a man and rule with pride and be firm in his decisions. Slowly but surely, the king's power began to grow again, and he became the most powerful force in Prussia. King Frederick died ten years later and his brother William took the throne after him. William hated Bismarck and didn't want to keep him around for long, but he also took his brother's throne, which meant all the problems that came with it. He was surrounded by enemies who wanted to reduce his power, and William even considered renouncing the throne because he wasn't sure he had the strength to deal with all the issues that came with being king. But Bismarck encouraged him otherwise. He stood by William and instituted the same pride and strength he did onto Frederick, William was thankful for Bismarck's help in making firm and quick action and began to grow dependent on him to keep his enemies away. And even though he still didn't like Bismarck, he made him his prime minister because he was the only one he could trust. Things weren't smooth between the two though. They would often argue about policies. Bismarck, as you can tell by now, being much more conservative. And whenever Bismarck threatened to resign as prime minister, King William would give in to his demands. Every time. In the coming years, it was Bismarck's policies and actions that united the German states into one country, and Bismarck let the king be crowned as Emperor of Germany. But while he had the title, it was really Bismarck that caused him to rise this far. But Bismarck wasn't too interested in the theatrics. He was right hand to the emperor, imperial chancellor and knighted prince, which meant that he had the real control, and since he was irreplaceable, it was really him that was ruling the empire. Some of you may already see it and others are probably wondering, how does this connect to Kanye West and Donald Trump? And for that we need to go into a brief history on the relationship between the two, because it didn't start in 2016. But we'll start at 2014 to save some time. And that was the year that Kim Kardashian and Kanye got married. When asked about it, Trump said, I certainly wish them the best of luck. I know them well and they're both very nice people. And at the VMAs in 2015, admittedly showing up high. After accepting his MTV Video Vanguard Award, Kanye went into a really long speech and at the end declared he was going to run for president in 2020. When speaking to Rolling Stone, Trump said, He said very nice things about me in the past. Extremely positive things. 
He's actually a different kind of person than people think. He's a nice guy. I hope to run against him someday. Trump would be one of the famous people featured naked in Kanye's music video for the song Famous on the Life of Pablo album, but Kanye made sure to let everyone know that it wasn't supporting or against anyone in the video, just a comment on fame. But in 2016, in San Jose, is when things changed. It was during the St. Pablo tour, which Kanye ended up cutting short. Many people said he was crazy, he was instituted into a hospital. But in one of his rants, he said, Voting for Trump don't mean that I don't think that black lives matter. That don't mean I don't believe in women's rights. That don't mean I don't believe in these things because that was the guy I would have voted for. If I would have voted, I would have voted for Trump. Soon after leaving the hospital... Kanye visited Donald Trump at the Trump Towers and was quoted as saying, I wanted to meet with Trump today to discuss multicultural issues. It's important to have a direct line of communication with our future president if we truly want change. For most of 2017, Kanye was off of social media and after reactivating his Twitter in April of 2018, he went through a tweet storm of announcing his albums and those albums for people in good music and showing support for Trump supporters like Candace Owens and stating in a tweet, You don't have to agree with Trump, but the mob can't make me not love him. We are both dragon energy. He's my brother. I love everyone. I don't agree with everything anyone does. That's what makes us individuals. And we have the right to independent thought. To which the president replied, Thank you, Kanye. Very cool. In an almost two-hour-long interview with Charlemagne, Kanye continued to side with Trump, or his statements on Trump, saying, when he was running, it's like I felt something. The fact that he won, it proved something. It proves that anything is possible in America. Donald Trump can be president of America. I'm not talking about what he's done since he's in office, but the fact that he was able to do it. Remember when I said I was going to run for president? I had people that was close to me, friends of mine, like making jokes, making memes, talking trash. Now it's like, oh, that was proven that that could have happened. I felt that non-conventional. In August of 2018, while on Jimmy Kimmel, he was asked a question where they quickly cut to a commercial break after. And social media, as well as the show, made it look like Kanye was stumped and unable to answer the question. Kanye cleared it up on Twitter saying, I'm reading that I was stumped by a question. Let me clarify the clickbait. I wasn't stumped. I wasn't given a chance to answer the question. And Donald Trump replied with a tweet saying, Thank you to Kanye West and the fact that he was willing to tell the truth. One new and great fact. African American unemployment is the lowest ever recorded in the history of our country. So honored by this. Thank you, Kanye, for your support. It is making a big difference. Last September, Kanye was the musical guest for Saturday Night Live, where he was told not to wear his MAGA hat. And after his live performance, he gave a message supporting Trump and wearing his hat that was cut from television. But a clip would show up online. One of the people to post it was Mike Dean, a close friend and producer for many years for Kanye. Trump came to Kanye's support the next day tweeting, Like many, I don't watch Saturday Night Live, even though I past hosted it. No longer funny. No talent or charm. It is just a political ad for the Dems. Word is that Kanye West, who put on a MAGA hat after the show, despite being told no, was great. He's leading the charge. And in October of 2018, Kanye West would meet at the Oval Office for a long 10-minute talk with Trump and the press where he's quoted as saying, It was something about when I put this hat on that made me feel like Superman. You made a Superman. That's my favorite superhero. You made a Superman, Kate. If you can't see it yet, a quote from this chapter should help you. Joining forces with the powerful can be foolish. They will swallow you up, just as the Doge of Venice swallowed up the Count of Carmagnola. No one will come to depend on you if they are already strong. If you are ambitious, it is much wiser to seek out weak rulers or masters with whom you can create a relationship of dependency. You become their strength, their intelligence, their spine. What power you hold. If they got rid of you, the whole edifice would collapse. This is the position Kanye West put himself in. Sure, Donald Trump is the President of the United States. One of, if not the most powerful position in the world. But in the realm that Kanye West exists, and to the millions of people that follow him and pop culture, the support for Trump was weak, or better yet, non-existent. He was hated ever since he became president, conveniently forgetting how much hip-hop loved referencing him and making songs about him before 2016. But Kanye West was the only one that 
really took initiative to befriend him and before saying we need an open line of communication and aid him like Bismarck did for King Frederick. Kanye said it's important to have a direct line to the president and that's what he has now. It's why he can pick up the phone and ask if Trump can do anything about ASAP Rocky. Another quote, The ultimate power is the power to get people to do as you wish. When you can do this without having to force people or hurt them, when they willingly grant you what you desire, then your power is untouchable. The best way to achieve this position is to create a relationship of dependence. The master requires your services. He is weak or unable to function without you. You have enmeshed yourself in his work so deeply that doing away with you would bring him great difficulty, or at least would mean valuable time lost in training another to replace you. Once such a relationship is established, you have the upper hand, the leverage to make the master do as you wish. Do not be one of the many who mistakenly believes that the ultimate form of power is independence. Power involves a relationship between people. You will always need others as allies, pawns, or even as weak masters who serve as your front. The completely independent man would live in a cabin in the woods. He would have the freedom to come and go as he pleased, but he would have no power. This is in essence the relationship between Kanye and Donald Trump. Name one other person in Hollywood, or the music business, specifically pop and hip-hop, the two biggest genres, that has shown some open support for Donald Trump, or even attempted to say that he wasn't as bad as people make him out to be. Now, when you add one of the most influential music artists of all time, Kanye West, supporting you, it's an irreplaceable relationship to have, and Donald Trump knows this. That's why Kanye West is able to phone directly to Donald Trump and see if he can help ASAP Rocky. And Trump, in a series of tweets, said, Just spoke to Kanye West about his friend ASAP Rocky's incarceration. I'll be calling the very talented Prime Minister of Sweden to see what we can do about helping ASAP Rocky. So many people would like to see this quickly resolved. Just had a very good call with Swedish Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, who assured me that American citizen ASAP Rocky will be treated fairly. Likewise, I assured him that ASAP was not a flight risk and offered to personally vouch for his bail, or an alternative. Our teams will be talking further, and we agreed to speak again in the next 48 hours. No other rapper or entertainer was able to offer a thing, other than an Instagram or Twitter post saying free ASAP Rocky, or a signature on some petition that nobody was ever going to read. But with the relationship that Kanye West had built with Trump, with Donald Trump depending on his support for a massive base that has been against Trump, he can pick up the phone and have the President of the United States vouch for the veil of his close friend, ASAP Rocky. There isn't much more you can do for someone than that. If Kanye West had just sat back and thrown hate Trump's way like the rest of his peers, he wouldn't have such a powerful ally. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough, and ASAP Rocky was charged by prosecutors and is facing up to two years. But Donald Trump even went further to criticize Sweden, saying, Very disappointed in Prime Minister Stefan Löfven for being unable to act. Sweden has let our African American community down in the United States. I watched the tapes of ASAP Rocky, and he was being followed and harassed by troublemakers. Treat Americans fairly. Free Rocky. Give ASAP Rocky his freedom. We do so much for Sweden, but it doesn't seem to work the other way around. Sweden should focus on its real crime problem. For Trump to go this far, for ASAP Rocky, just shows how valuable the relationship he has with Kanye West is, and also how valuable it looks to him press-wise to help him as well. This isn't the first time Trump has helped Kanye and his family, or wife, either. Last year, Kim Kardashian appealed for a 63-year-old woman by the name of Alice Marie Johnson, who was convicted in 1996 of drug trafficking and money laundering. She was sentenced to life in prison, and it was only her first offense. She brought this case to Trump, Kim Kardashian did, who would pardon the lady, and she is now a free woman. She was previously denied a pardon by President Obama, so if it wasn't for the relationship the West family had with Trump, she likely would have been denied once again. The reversal to this law is as follows. The weakness of making others depend on you is that you are in some measure dependent on them. But trying to move beyond that point means getting rid of those above you. It means standing alone, depending on no one. Such is the monopolistic drive of a J.P. Morgan or a John D. Rockefeller to drive out all competition, to be in complete control. If you can corner the market, so much the better. We've seen certain music artists like Russ, Ugly God, Tyler the Creator, 
and even J. Cole to a certain extent do this. They can exist all on their own, doing almost everything it takes from writing, production, and mastering their tracks, and have had great success and a large income from it. They aren't dependent on anyone else such as rappers who have admittedly complained they waited weeks, sometimes months, just for their finished album to get mixed and mastered. There are benefits to this type of approach. One is that if your relationship falls apart with a producer, as an artist that got big working with said producer, your sound changes, and it might cause you to lose fans if you can't make the change seamless. In the scenario of doing it all on your own, you don't have that worry, but it's also very alienating from the rest of your peers. Russ has very few fellow artists that are close friends, if even acquaintances in the industry, and he seems to be okay with that. There's a price to pay for everything. Today we're going to be talking about a really interesting story. It's about how Master P finesse Universal Music Group out of 10 million, or more, dollars, and left the music industry afterwards. Law 12 is as follows. Use selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim. One sincere and honest move will cover over dozens of dishonest ones. Open-hearted gestures of honesty and generosity bring down the guard of even the most suspicious people. Once your selective honesty opens a hole in their armor, you can deceive and manipulate them at will. A timely gift, a Trojan horse, will serve the same purpose. The story we're going to look into is one of a con artist named Count Victor Lustig. He was known as one of the greatest con artists of the past several hundred years. After all, he's most known for selling the Eiffel Tower not once, but twice. He could speak multiple languages, had no fear, was cultured, and knew style like few others. And he had a very strong grasp of human psychology. He could spot a sucker from a mile away, and not only that, but understand his exact weakness. And he decided to go after a big fish this time. The Count would make a visit to Chicago, Illinois, just like you would expect from a con man, like Neil from White Collar if you've ever watched that TV series. Fresh suit, nice shoes, all that. In 1926, he made a visit to who was not only the most powerful gangster, but one of the most powerful people in America, someone everybody feared. He came in and made the proposition to Al Capone that if he would lend him $50,000, then he could double it. $50,000 was nothing to Al Capone, but he wasn't the kind of person to just give an amount like this to someone he never met. But just looking at the Count's style and the way he made the request, Al Capone wanted to play along. He counted out all the bills right in front of him and handed them saying, Okay, Count, double it in 60 days, like you said. You might think the story ends here. After all, he got his 50 racks. It's time to dip, go into hiding, but no. That's not what happens. Right after receiving the money, the Count put it in a safety deposit box in Chicago and left to New York where he had a couple of other cons going on. The $50,000 just sat there. The Count didn't even bother to try to double it or increase it at all. After 60 days, he went back to Chicago, got the money out of the deposit box, and made another visit to Al Capone. When he got there, he smiled at the bodyguards who didn't look too happy and said to Al Capone, Please accept my profound regrets, Mr. Capone. I'm sorry to report that the plan failed. I failed. Al Capone stood up and was angry. But he wasn't stupid. He assumed that this was the likely outcome, but now it was time to decide where he was going to dump the Count's body after he was finished with him, or his bodyguards were finished with him. But before anything could happen, the Count reached into his pocket and pulled out the $50,000 he was given and put it on Al Capone's desk. Here, sir, is your money. To the penny. Again, my sincere apologies. This is most embarrassing. Things didn't work out the way I thought they would. I would have loved to have doubled your money for you and for myself. Lord knows I need it, but the plan just didn't materialize. At this point, Al Capone was in shock. He said, I know you're a con man, Count. I knew it the moment you walked in here. I expected either $100,000 or nothing. But this? Getting my money back? Well, my god, you're honest. If you're on the spot, here's five to help you along. And Al Capone counted out $5,000 and handed them to the count. When I first read this story, it was bizarre. You can imagine someone like Al Capone had hundreds, if not thousands, of people request money from him 
for different opportunities, some of which just took the money and spent it, and others may have tried to invest it but failed. And some may have brought him a return on his investment. But like he said, he was usually expecting either nothing to come back or a massive return from what he was used to. But he had never gotten the exact same amount he loaned out. And when I said Count Lustig knew human psychology down to each individual, he knew the biggest weakness for someone in Al Capone's position was honesty. He was used to people always lying or deceiving in his business. So how could he possibly distrust someone who was honest? It's a depressing position to be in, so if Al Capone were to encounter someone with generosity and trustworthiness, then he would feel like there was finally someone who wasn't out to get something from him. But he did want something. From the beginning of the con, the count was after the amount of money that he got in the end. Taking the $50,000 would have been too dangerous. Running away from a man like Al Capone wasn't going to be an enjoyable life. And there was a reason he mentioned in the end that he was struggling with money, but still managed to return the full amount he was given. It was to appeal to Al Capone's sensitive side. Here was a man who came through with a level of honesty he's never experienced before and didn't take a single dollar from the money he borrowed, even though he was going through financial struggles and needed it. The least Al Capone could do was throw him a couple of thousand dollars. Something similar to this but not exactly the same happened with Master P and Universal Records. It's a relatively low-key story because almost all of the videos of this interview with Chameleonaire were taken off of the internet, mainly YouTube. If you're unfamiliar with Master P, he was one of the first real businessmen to come out of rap music, doing the independent hustle long before anyone else, and in 1996 signed a music distribution deal with Priority Records. No Limit Records, which was Master P's record label, would keep 100% ownership of their master's recordings and get 85% of the record sales, while Priority got 15% for pressing all the CDs and distributing them. I'm going to play the video clip for you right now. And this is the way the industry is designed. You gotta audit them and fight to get your money. It's not like the contract is just, you know, they're gonna follow it. You know, you gotta be smart enough to know that, okay, they're gonna try to inflate all these charges let me find a way to get my money out of them. Yeah. You know, I, I, Master P told me the illest story one time, man. I don't even know if I should repeat it, but he Tell left, us. He left this industry. <laughs> <laughs> he left this industry, man, and um, I was used to going to the Universal offices, and I would be like, um, they would be talking crazy about Master P. I'm like, man, why y'all talking crazy about Master P? They're like, oh, Master P ran off with all the money, and he we gave him a big deal, and he ran off with the money. So I, I, I got in touch with Master P, and I'm talking to Master P, and I'm trying to get him on something, and Master P is like, Nah, I don't. I, I can't. I can't do it. I'm not doing nothing for the industry. I'm gone. And I'm like, why? You know, you built this. You, you were the person that started this for me. And he was like, I said, why did everybody talk crazy about you? They said you, you took it, took money from him. He says, no, I took my money. <laughs> when he was doing what he was doing with Master P, with No Limit, he was putting his uncle on. He's putting his niece on. He was putting everybody on, and everybody was going platinum, right? So he's supposed to get this big check because he's doing it independently. When he gets his check. All this money is missing, and he's like, where's the rest of the money? And the label says, hey, we did all this. We got 400000 for marketing. We got this for that. He was like, what? I'm the one that did all that. What? Show me the proof. There was no proof. So Master P couldn't get his money from them. Right. So Master P says, okay, I'm going to create this new thing, new No Limit or whatever, right? And he keeps it cool. He's like, hey, I'm going to do this big deal. I'm going to do all the videos. I'm going to do all this stuff for all the artists. And the label says, okay. They give him a big, he says, I want the money up front, though. Mm. So I'm not going to say how much they gave him, but they gave him a whole lot of money. And they took the money. So now the artists start blowing up, and they go to Universal like, it's time to do the video. And they say, no, we gave Master P all the money. Go get him to do the video. So they run to Master P, and Master P, they, they say, hey, P, the label told me that you got the money for my video, my budget. And he says, no, I got my money. Right. <laughs> so he found a way to get his money back from Universal. Right, right, right. And then he was like, I'm out. And he cashed out, and he left the industry. And to me, I was like, man, that's the most genius thing ever. <laughs> like, I wish I could cash out right He's now. He's smart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm thinking of my ways to cash out. But, I, you know, that, that showed me the. Uh, he's like a hustler, you know yeah, what I'm saying? He came to him like, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to make this make a lot of money. And then he used that to flip into other businesses. And, you know, the industry is designed like that. you got to almost cheat it. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know. I hope he's not mad at me. If you're a little confused as to what happened here, 
Master P was an independent hustler, like I said before. He was making his own money and promoting and marketing himself, so he didn't need the budgets that these labels were paying for other artists on their roster. However, when it came time for payday, he realized that he was still getting the same cut as every other artist, but he was out hustling them and basically doing the label's job on his own. The label deducted these as expenses, which means they pocketed the money, while Master P did all the work for them, and they couldn't even provide him proof where all these marketing expenses they claim they spent on him. So, Master P decided he wasn't going to wild out on them, and the label loved him. After all, he was making them just as much, if not way more money than all these other artists on their roster, and they barely even had to do anything. It was like having an employee and an artist. They were getting paid extra for him doing twice the amount of work. So when he proposed a partnership deal to Universal Records for his venture, The New No Limit, he told them he was going to do what he was already doing for not only himself, but many other artists he was going to sign under that new label. Universal was probably doing the Birdman hand rub at this time. But this time, Master P asked him for a fat advance, which I'm just guessing was in the neighborhood of $10 million, if Chameleonaire didn't want to say anything. Remember, this was in 2001, around there. So fat advances were still a thing. The record label agreed. If Master P could bring in all that money on his own, imagine how much he could bring in with a huge advance. Well, Master P just took that money and dipped out of the industry. And when the artists under Universal were asking for funding for their music videos and stuff, the label sent them to Master P, saying he got their money. But Master P told them he doesn't have their money, he got his money that they refused to give him before. He just found another way to get to it. And after that, he left the industry and began distributing No Limit Records through Coke Records, which is now known as Entertainment One. The record labels began to talk bad about Master P, but the truth was, he just played them at their own game. They were pocketing money that was rightfully his. The same expenses that they would have paid to marketing companies should have been allocated to him and the same for certain distribution costs when he was selling the records himself. But Master P knew he couldn't just argue or fight them head on, because they had way more resources than he did, and suing them was only going to end up in him wasting so much money on legal fees, more than what they were probably going to give him at the end of the trial. So just like every other artist, he appeared to just accept things as they were and come to the label with a new proposition. In this case, instead of like Count Lustig, he was after a fat check, more than what they had taken from him. And he approached them with finesse and a proposition that would benefit them. And they had no reason not to believe him because he had been honest and demonstrated everything he proposed to them for the new No Limit with his own career and his brother's Sea Murder and Silk the Shocker and his previous roster on No Limit Records. This law does have a reversal this time, and it's as follows. When you have a history of deceit behind you, no amount of honesty, generosity, or kindness will fool people. In fact, it will only call attention to itself. Once people have come to see you as deceitful, to act honest all of a sudden is simply suspicious. In these cases, it is better to play the rogue. This is the case rappers like 6 9 or Soldier Boy find themselves in. They've lied so many times, or trolled, whichever you want to call it, that even when they're trying to be honest, it doesn't work out in their favor. Nobody wanted to believe that 6 9 had really been jumped and robbed that one evening, or that Soldier Boy had really been arrested, until verifiable sources began reporting it. And even then, many people still didn't believe it until there was no longer a shred of a doubt. But they would use these things to their advantage. They played the role of the rogue. They were never really trying to be believed. For instance, the music video for 6 9 ines song with Nicki Minaj was supposed to debut either the same day or the day after that incident. And in many other rappers' promotional strategies, they would fake getting arrested for an Instagram post, knowing it would get attention, but it was really just actors in the set of a music video. Not only does it make one unpredictable, there is always a division of people who think this is real, or think this is fake, and they begin arguing, only bringing more fuel to the fire. In this case, promotion for the artist, which is a win on all fronts. An extreme example was when XXXTentacion 
was preparing to promote his new music video for the song Riot, and he deleted all of his posts on Instagram and only had one of a figure that looked like himself dangling from a rope tied to a tree with a mysterious caption. This caused a storm of publicity, with nearly every media outlet covering it because if it was real, it would have made sense. He was going through a lot in his life from losing a close friend, the media hating him, the case still looming over his head, and the dozens of other issues from his past. But there were some other people that thought it was fake and just for attention, and they just began to argue back and forth, very passionately, until it was revealed it was a music video, and the initial views it got on the first date were massive. XXS Tentacion did say he wasn't sure how people were going to perceive the promotional message, and I can't pretend to know his intentions. But regardless, this was hiding the truth, not necessarily lying, and seeing what the outcome would be. If he had said music video coming soon as a caption, it wouldn't have had nearly the same effect in promotion that it did with that picture and caption. Even a 10 year old could insinuate what that meant. On the top right is a playlist for the rest of the series on the 48 Laws of Power. If you haven't seen them yet, I highly suggest you watch it if you enjoyed this video. Also, comment any other incidents of this law being used below. Like and subscribe and hit the notification bell if you enjoyed, and see you in the next video.